everybody. Welcome, Michelle. Um, this is one of those events in our committee where we're like, wow, all new people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> including Michelle. I can't remember yeah. 10 years I've been here that you've testified to this. I don't think I have. I actually, I'm embarrassed to say is I, uh, I on the way up here, so Ron called. We just had a little Which room. And I had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I apologize. And I'm sorry for the mix-up. But Ron said something to me about, see you tomorrow. And I, it was on my, we had a meeting notice for Thursday. So I wasn't expecting to be here this morning. So sure. Well, I appreciate you having the free, free sure. schedule. We yeah. don't seem to get that kind of freedom from our from Damien these days. No, um, it was just, it's a fluke. It's a, so. It's a, so it's great. So the um, first thing, um, just committee, we invited Michelle in. Uh, Michelle is the lead attorney on S54 and has been working on cannabis in this building probably for the last six or eight years in any way from medical marijuana on. More than 20, actually. More than 20. So, yeah. Primarily with judiciary, right? Am I, am I right? Yep. And um, and so she's the lead attorney on, on S54. There are control. There are there are parts of the bill that have to do with control, which is again in our realm of our sphere of, of knowledge or or of, um, in our portfolio. So I asked Michelle to come up and to talk about the aspects of S54 that fit into that um, we won't own we don't own the bill this is a, essentially a courtesy call um, to let us know what's what's going on in the cannabis bill um, Michelle and then for folks around the room because I don't know many of you I'm we're, let's just introduce ourselves so we know who's here I'm representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury um, representative Gonzalez is not here um, from Winooski uh, representative Matt Byron Virgins uh, Randall Zog Barner Representative Lisa Hango for Berkshire. Mariana Gamash from Swanton. John Kalaki, South Burlington. Tommy Waltz, Berry City. Mary Howard, Bretton City. Chip Troyano, Standard. I'm Katie, I'm an intern with Sats and Renfrew, and we represent a few uh, medical marijuana dispensaries. I'm Stephanie Winters from the Vermont Medical Society and the American Academy of Pediatrics, Vermont Chuck. Hi, Matt McMahon with MMR. Uh, we're working with NCS and Maximus, two IT companies on this. Worth Allen with Downtrack and Martin, representing Grassroots Vermont. Dylan Zwicky, Leonard Public Affairs here on behalf of Trace uh, IT Company. Marie Hormar with the Department of Public Safety. I'm Laura Subin. I direct the Vermont Coalition to Regulate Marijuana. Gary Kessler from the Department of Liquor and Lottery. Great, and we do have on our on our document page for today. We do have a letter from Representative Copeland Hansis that does ask uh, that does ask us to take a look uh, at this information. We can look at that letter a little bit later. Um, we don't need to see it today, but um, just as a, to one of those formal requests, or not on letterhead requests. <laughs> what? Did it not come through that way? Uh -huh. I guess not. Um, it's up behind you, Michelle. Um, and so it just says basically uh, if we could review the provisions dealing with the municipality's authority to opt in, opt out, uh, to operate within its jurisdiction, and the creation and operation of a local licensing commission, and send any thoughts to them. Um, so that's where we are. Um, so, Michelle, the microphone's yours. Please Thank take it away. So, um, so in thinking about how to, it's a really broad topic, it's a big bill, and I know you're looking at kind of a, a particular issue. Um, if, it, if it works for you, let me just tell you kind of what I was thinking, which is I'll just talk to you a little bit about how marijuana is treated uh, in Vermont, under Vermont law currently, what you have, and then I can just do um, a broad overview of the bill so you, un so you have the context, because I think it's hard for you to kind of talk about your specific licensing or opt-in or opt-out issues and how it parallels or should it parallel the way that you do without with alcohol if you don't understand some of the other other moving parts but let me know if I'm either going too fast or I'm uh, or I'm you know talking about too much stuff that doesn't particularly interest you yeah I think um, it's I think it's more introductory to that to okay. exactly what the broad picture is and then how it comes down to I mean, I, I'm looking to have a timeline, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. So, so how far we get for the time that we have you is sufficient, and we may have okay. you back. And we have until 10:30 this morning, or yeah. oh. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so generally, uh, m the way that marijuana is dealt with under Vermont law is that uh, you have your, it's in Title 18, so it's actually in the health title in Chapter 84 under regulated drugs. And so within that chapter, you have, um, traditionally you have the criminal, criminal and civil provisions for uh, marijuana. There is also hemp, but that's treated completely differently. And so when I'm talking about marijuana, or as the bill talks about and talks about cannabis, so we're trying to switch our terminology, is uh, I'm talking about so marijuana cannabis, but if I'm talking about hemp, I'll specifically say hemp. And that's in Title VI in the agriculture title, and that's dealt with separately, and that's not dealt with in S-54, so you're not talking about at all about the regulation of hemp. Um, so uh, you have, in Title 84, you have the criminal and civil provisions. You also have Chapter 86 in Title 18, which is the medical marijuana program. So you have, uh, so you, that, that, that is essentially exemptions from the criminal and civil penalties if you participate in the program. So with regard to the chapter 84, the way that it's structured is you have a list of regulated drugs. So you have marijuana, you have cocaine, you have heroin, you have narcotics, you have things like that. And then there are penalties for unlawful possession, dispensing, and sale of those drugs. So in 2013, the Vermont legislature decriminalized possession of an ounce or less of marijuana for adults 21 years of age and older. So that was 2013. Then in 2017, the legislature passed a law essentially removing the civil penalties that have been established in 2013. They removed the civil penalties for possession of an ounce or less of marijuana by adults uh, 21 years of older. The governor vetoed that, but then the legislature came back and it was one of the first things she did in 2018. And so last year, you passed H511, and on July 1st of last year, it became legal under state law for adults to possess an ounce or less of marijuana. It also allows adults to grow up to two mature plants and four immature plants. And anything that that person harvests from their plant, as long as they keep it in a secure location on the property where the plants were grown, that harvested marijuana doesn't count towards your ounce possession. So that's kind of where that's where things sit now. And when I and I'll stop saying 21 and over, and just so you know, anytime I talk about adult possession, it's always 21. There's never any discussion in 54 or anything else about. Um, allowing anyone under the age of 21 to possess. The exception is in the medical program where they do have patients who are under the age of 21 who are registered patients under the medical program. So in 2004, Vermont became the, the I think the ninth state to adopt a medical marijuana registry program. And, um, and so it is uh, regulated, it is under the Department of Public Safety, why Marie is here. And um, so they've had, we've had a program for 15 years almost in mm -hmm. Vermont. And then I think it was in 2011 that the General Assembly have passed uh, legislation um, allowing for medical marijuana dispensaries. Up until that time, the law was silent on where, so it said basically if you are a registered patient or you can be, you can register with DPS as a caregiver to either grow marijuana for someone or help them administer it or possess it for them, um, the limit is uh, two ounces and, uh, and they can have two mature plants and seven immature plants, so it's slight, slightly more, same with regard to the mature plants, but a few more with regard to the immature plants. Um, and essentially, if you are a registered patient, um, then you are exempt from any penalties with regard to, to possessing that. And so then in 2011, there was dispensary legislation, and then those got rolling after a couple of years. So we currently have um, five licensed dispensaries in the state. They are allowed to have essentially two points of sales where they meet with patients um, to, to serve them and uh, provide them with cannabis and cannabis products. They are also obviously regulated by the Department of Public Safety. Um, Good questions here. Uh, Michelle, would, can you tell the folks um, how many um, states now, presently, since we passed it, presently have uh, medical uh, cannabis? Uh, 
uh, mid 30s, and then I think there may be, and maybe there are, there might be a few more that have, you know, very much more limited, um, kind of like so for the, you know, the low THC, high CBD, certain types of, of that. But and then just a quick definition of a mature versus immature plant. Um, how does that work in terms of? It, will my immature plants eventually become mature yes. after I harvest the mature plants? Is that yes, yes? I think there's a there's a real art there about you know trying to make sure you've only got two mature and what counts in the flowering and there's definitions in uh, in chapter 86 that talk about what constitutes the mature plants versus the immature plants. Right. So that's so I can have essentially I can harvest. Right, so you can have two mature, you can harvest, you do whatever you do, you compost those, and then you let the other, you know, the others grow. And but at any one time. In you can only have two mature plants. Right, right. okay. I just want to be clear, because that's always like, well, why would I want immature plants? In right, because you're staging them. Um, right. Right, exactly. And, um, and uh, Carrie Gagere from the Agency of Agriculture is a great person to talk to about plants. I still, even after all these years, I'm still a little fuzzy on how all the botany stuff works with the... <laughs> well, there's so many changes. I mean, there's so many, even in the botany of it, there's so many different right. levels of it. So um, so right now, status right now is that medical marijuana um, under certain, certain, well, marijuana in general mm -hmm. is legal to possess. Yes. Um, in the D state. In the state. DPS is, is, is uh, controls the medical mm -hmm. side of it. They, and they control the oversight of, of personal consumption right now? No, no, there's 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 no control over it. It's just basically when you think about it and you think about generally the drug laws is that you're you're prohibiting people from possessing certain types of drugs. Um, and then what you did with 511 last year is you just said we're taking the penalty away. We're just going to be silent. We're just going to say there is no penalty for possession of an ounce or less of, of cannabis. And so there are you know, if somebody possesses more than that, then law enforcement would enforce the laws that you have on the books that, so if you possess over an ounce, um, there's still criminal penalties. It's a misdemeanor, you know, up to a certain amount, and then you go into felony level. It's illegal to uh, to sell any, um, any marijuana outside of, unless you're a licensed dispensary. You can, if you are an adult, uh, you can share amongst other adults as long as you stay within your limit. So the idea is that if, if I'm allowed to have an ounce and you're allowed to have an ounce and we want to say, well, I have this particular strain and you have a different kind of strain, let's trade a quarter of an ounce and you can try what I grew and I can try what you grew, that's all fine, um, but you cannot sell it. And so part of the possession <coughs> also is public consumption is still considered? Public consumption is prohibited. Um, there's a very, very broad definition of uh, a public place in the law. Again, this was part of H511 that was passed. And um, I would just say the general rule is, um, you know, private residences you can, you can, um, you can use, but um, most other places, no. So no public, no places of public accommodation, no hotels, no, no workplaces. It's, um, it's, it's not only public accommodations, but it's also any place where it's prohibited to have a lighted tobacco product or a tobacco substitute. So workplaces that might not otherwise be considered a place of public accommodation would then fall under that. You can't be walking down the street smoking a joint. Um, you can't be in your car um, doing it. Um, so, and that's a ticketable offense. That's a civil violation. So that would be something like an officer, just like a moving violation that you would get. So if anybody's gotten a speeding ticket or something like that, officer writes you a ticket. There's a, you know, you can admit it and pay the waiver fee right there and then mail it in to the Judicial Bureau if you want to do that. You could go to the Judicial Bureau and challenge it if you wanted to, but it's a civil violation. And also quickly, I guess, the marijuana federally is considered Class was one. class one drug, which means according to the federal government, there's no medical right. benefit to marijuana, which has prevented, which, which has created this realm of prohibition for yes. eighty plus years. Is that? Uh, well, there's an evolving 
body of you know of what con of basically how the laws been treated federally with regard to cannabis, but um, the Controlled Substances Act, which was passed in 1970 or early 70s, is what um, what it falls under now. And there's a schedule of, of for the drugs, and marijuana is listed as a Schedule One, which means that you there's no medically recognized value to it, um, and it is illegal. So under federal law, it is illegal to possess it, to sell it, to dispense it, any of, any of those things. And, and so- What other drugs are those? I always forget, it's always, it's, it, um, it's interesting because when you look at it, I think generally people look at it and say, oh, the, Interesting. This is way down on number three, but this is up here, and so I can get you, I can send you a copy. Of yeah, I'm just trying to give a little bit of a context because states yes. are now being states. The federal government has; they're not quite looking the other way, nor should they. Right. But they are allowing states to try to develop a, uh, these policies. That are right, for right. yeah, there's been an evolution with the new administration, it's less clear. Um, so, I will say that on the medical side, there's been a rider on the uh, department of the Federal Department of Justice uh, uh, funding that basically says that they can't use DOJ can't use any of its funding to, um, to enforce the CSA against state medical programs. So, that's been something, and Congress has to renew that every year, but that's been going on for a few years now. Um, and then under the Obama administration, the Attorney General had issued a couple memos that essentially said with regard to states that had legal adult <coughs> use commercial systems, um, that they had a, you know, they were, they were acknowledging that they have the ability under the CSA to come down and enforce the CSA on folks, but that as long as states were, had programs that were complying with eight certain criteria, um, that they were going to use their DOJ resources judiciously and they weren't going to expend them on coming down on states that had programs that were regulated. I think, and so they were concerned about things like organized crime, they were concerned about diversion to youth, they were concerned about diversion of cannabis from a legal state into other jurisdictions where it wasn't legal. So they had a list of that. But, um, but under the Trump administration, um, they, uh, Attorney, they go so fast, but Attorney General from Sessions. Alabama, yeah, Sessions, <laughs> Sessions, uh, <laughs> Sessions pulled back that uh, that memo, and so uh, what was referred to there was coal coal memo one, and then coal memo two. <coughs> he rescinded those, and so it's been a little more, you know, kind of we, we don't really know um, how the federal government would respond to a they wouldn't be able to use DOJ resources on the medical programs, but how would they respond to states that have a, a, a regulated commercial market. I mean, I will say that you now have 11 <laughs> jurisdictions where cannabis is legal at the state level for adults, um, and you have the entire West Coast. So when you think all the way down, so you've got Washington, Oregon, uh, California, Nevada, so you've got a, you've got a substantial, I don't know. Where there's you know, tax and regulate. Where there's tax and regulate, right. Um, you now have it in, in the Northeast as well, where you have Massachusetts, so we have a, a border state with Massachusetts that has a, a regulated commercial system. They started their first sales um, last November, um, and so they're still up, you know, getting things up and running, but they have a number of retail outlets that are operating um, in uh, Massachusetts, and a, a few that are very close to the Vermont line. I think the one in Williamstown is here. <coughs> Just start just opened or is about to open um, and then Maine which passed a ballot initiative a number of years ago but that's been locked up and a lot of things going on and so they haven't gotten their program online yet but um, and then you also have to have Quebec because it's legal in all of Canada and so the prop provincial governments run um, their various programs of how they, how they do that so I, I don't know if it's still true but I, my understanding is that the states that have um, a regulated amount, the banks aren't willing to accept the cash. 
because of the federal issues? And so what happened, what, what's, what kind of economy is this if they can't bank the money? Or is that, is that not true, do you know? I think it's a, you know, it's a little true. Banking is certainly tough. There is legislation moving through Congress right now to provide kind of more of a safe harbor for banking institutions mm -hmm. that do provide services to cannabis businesses because it is huge business. Yeah. Um, uh, right now. Um, I know that the Vermont dispensaries have used um, local credit unions. Okay. Um, and so that has been a, a possibility. I mean, I would just say that the banking gets a little complicated. It's not typically my lane, um, but I know that one of these letters that went to y'all also went to Commerce. So they're going to be looking at the banking issues this week, um, but uh, there's, there's not a whole lot, obviously, states can do on that. Um, but um, cannabis businesses are finding a way to, to do that. Something that is in um, S-54 is passed by the Senate that the tax department asked for was the uh, ability, the authority to ban cash payments if they felt as though they needed to do that because they did not want to be handling huge amounts of cash. Which would then force to an electronic other checks or electronic. So, all right. So that's a quick. Work, that's a that's a pretty twenty five thousand yep. foot um, look at, at things right now. So so what is S fifty four? Let's take it down. What does S fifty four do? And yep. how did we get to have S fifty four? So S fifty four. So those of you who've been here for a few years will remember. So I think the the real activity on looking at a commercial market was in 2015, although I would say, you know, again, I've been here 20 plus years and I've written um, uh, TNR bills that whole time. They used to be short form uh, is when I first started them and I was thankful for that <laughs> at the time. Uh, but um, so they, it has been dis, you know, percolating for a while, but what you saw in 2014 was the first states doing the ballot initiatives to adopt a commercial market. So, and I will just mention is that all the states that do have commercial markets now have done it through ballot initiatives. No state has done it through the legislative process to date. Um, uh, and also just to note is that there's two states, Vermont and, the, well, it's not a state, but Washington, D.C., we're the two that have legalized cannabis but do not have a regulated market. So. And so that's important only because of the process. I mean, ballot initiatives are, which we generally don't allow, mm -hmm. are <coughs> in, in, mm -hmm. in Vermont. Right. Um, that's, those are those states' voters that have a process to say, we want this, you figure it out. Or, or there's even a structure. Yes. Because I remember Massachusetts had a very different structure that was approved versus what was eventually put into place after it went through its legislative process after the, the, uh, the vote. Well, the, you have the ballot initiative, and it'll lay out kind of the skeletal structure. You shall have, you know, so, so in Mass, it's they, I would say, you know, what this is most closely, 54 most closely mirrors Mass's structure with regard to having an independent control commission rather than it being housed in the existing uh, state agency. And so they kind of lay those things out, and then it's up for the legislature to come in and start to fill in the gaps, and the agencies start to work together and develop the rules and fill in all the little details so you don't have like a 500 page ballot initiative. But it's it's the voters being able to say absolutely right that that we we make this legal right yep and, that and that's how they did it also in Washington D.C. but because Congress has ability to yay and nay certain things with D.C. basically they went and they opened it up to do to remove the penalties but they um, were stopped from uh, from moving forward on their commercial system and the regular. Right. And just to be clear, our process to, requires us to have that legislation in place to then vote yes or no. Yes, we don't have ballot initiatives. So right. we do not. Yep. Um, so essentially, what uh, I'll walk you through the timeline first, and then maybe we'll take start to take a look at the bill. Is that um, so? The regulator there is a new regulatory uh, body that is created within the bill, which would be the Cannabis Control Board. So like I just mentioned, is in other states, it may be that they take an existing department, 
So it might be their liquor control, or in California, it's the Bureau of Consumer Justice, or in Colorado, it's their Department of Revenue, so their tax department. Um, so states you know, have that organized differently. Um, but uh, this proposal in 54 creates a new regulatory body, the Cannabis Control Board, that would be independent. There would be um, uh, folks appointed by the, the Senate and the House and the governor, and this would be the board that would control the commercial market, and then eventually the medical marijuana registry and the dispensary program would shift over from the Department of Public Safety to be under the purview of the board. Um, and so, uh, so just the timeline is that the board would be created this July. They would start their terms in September. Um, they hire an executive director and an administrative assistant, and then they start the work of, uh, of rulemaking for those three different programs. There's also um, a lot of language in here about how next January that executive director would come back to the General Assembly and report on a number of issues. Um, I'll just mention that the, the rulemaking is really the heavy lift for the board that first uh, fiscal year in their operation is that there, you know, there's a lot of work for them to do with regard to establishing the tiering for the different types of licenses and things like that. So, but that's what primarily what they'll be working on. But they'll have um, the ED comes back to you next January with a proposal for the fees for all the different licenses. There are fees are not established in here. Um, there's just the different types of licenses and a nod towards that there should be tiering of certain licenses. So like an example with regard to cultivators, um, there's a lot of interest in making sure that there are a lot of um, smaller tiers that have an easier price point with a goal of trying to bring some people from the illegal or as many people as you can from the illegal market into the regulated market and so um, you know a lot of discussion about how do you do that you don't want to price people out you want to try to bring people in um, so they would come back to you in, in next January with proposals for all those tiers for the licenses for the fees they're going to come back and recommend the build out for the second fiscal year do they need to add positions in order to, to process applications? Do they need to add a plant inspector? Do they, can, you know, should they be relying on other agencies to assist them with these things? So that would be next January. And then in uh, the following July, uh, the fee structure would take place, it, but again, it's you setting the fees, it's not the board. Um, and then there's a rolling application period for the different types of licenses. There's five licenses, there's cultivators, there's product manufacturers, um, there are testing labs, wholesalers, and retailers. Um, people can apply for uh, one of each. And so and something that's something that's different from the medical program. The medical program is, is vertically integrated. So under one license, they, can, they do all of those things. So they can, they can grow the cannabis, they can turn it into um, oils or lozenges and then they, they do everything up into the point of sale to the to the patients but under this proposal you would have if you wanted to do all of that you'd have to get one of each or you might get a cultivator license and a wholesaler or however you wanted to mix and match but no more than one type of license so you couldn't have a big company, you know, that you see out west, like MedMen or something like that, come in and have like five retail stores. It's not going to be like Domino's. It's, it's that's that's precluded in this in this bill. And Representative Trina. So it's contemplated that um, a cultivator <coughs> will need to use a wholesaler to get it to the retail market. <laughs> Is that? Doesn't have to. Um, okay. You know, doesn't have to be. And again, those are things that there's going to be a lot of rulemaking. It's just more that they wanted to create an option for a wholesaler. Again, trying to think about small mm -hmm. growers. So if you have a lot of, let's say, little cult, little yeah. grow operations, maybe you have a farm that they normally grow, I don't know, broccoli, but they say, well, we want to supplement it and we want to grow a little bit of cannabis on the side, but, um, but they don't want to go through and and trim it and, and take, you know, do all the stuff that you have to do to then, you know, take it all the stocks, all of that kind of stuff is maybe you have a wholesaler who comes by and goes and visits the little 
farmers who have that, and then they take it and they process it into something, and then the wholesaler then takes that and sells that to the retailers. Is that's an option? But the cultivator could has the ability to sell directly to the retailer or a product manufacturer if they They're want. They're just to. separate licenses. That's Different what you're licenses us now. Yep. And um, would the cultivator? Um, sell to the wholesaler uh, by weight? Is that what's contemplated? You just, you know, take your bail and they it, There's not that level of specificity okay. in the bill. Okay. And I think yeah. these are things that asking. are going to be done by rulemaking. Okay, um, very good. Yeah, we'll go there. Yeah, thanks. So, um, Representative Walls and... Um, I, yeah, I think you probably just answered my question. It's going to be rulemaking. I'm just picturing farm stands. Nope. Uh, well... <laughs> Hard to imagine under the right. structure. Um, if you had a farm, you couldn't have a farm stand because I think that there are certain things that are around with regard to the retail sales. Um, so, but that concept, if you had a farmer who wanted to do direct sales, that farmer would have to have a cultivator license and a retail license, and then they would have to comply with all the regulatory provisions for those. So, like if you're going to be a retailer, you know, you've got to card everybody. You're going to have to have certain right. kind of uh, um, requirements. Like one of the things in here is that you have to have products where the customers are not allowed to have access to the products. Like it has to be through, you know, a, a counter purchase. And so it's not like when you go to the farm stand and you get to squeeze the melons. Uh, the pink around. Right, no, you don't get to do any of that. You would have to, there's going to be a person in between who's going to have the product. Usually it's between, you know, like in glass cases, and if somebody says, well, I would, could I, could I see that product, please? And the person takes it out and shows it to you, and they've got cameras everywhere to make sure nobody's pinching anything of the product, that kind of stuff, yeah. so. Um, one more, it's a point of clarity on the licensing. Mm -hmm. um, could one organization be a grower or wholesaler and a retailer? Yes. Okay, so yes. they can do that, but they can't have multiple. Exactly. Licenses so yeah. So category. exactly. So they could do the whole line. Okay. So they could have the existing chain. They just have to break it up into. Well, could, so one organization, so like one S corp or LLC or whatever, could mm -hmm. own all three licenses. Yes. They don't have to like part it out. Right. Okay. Yep. Representative Kabach. So it could be modeled initially, anyway, after the way dispenser growers. Dispensaries. Dispensaries. Dispensaries can also grow. Yes. There are very specific. So in terms of retailing, produce, cultivating, wholesaling it, and retailing it, it, it could be, it could work under that model. Yes, yes, they could be vertically integrated, but instead of one permit, they would have to get these all five. Yep. And so it's trying to provide, again, I think, up a lot economic mm -hmm. opportunity for people to participate in the market in um, in a lot of different ways and um, uh, so that if somebody just wants to do one one thing or have a small mm -hmm. business or they want to kind of pull you know a few different things together I think you know one of the centers was talking about a constituent who's interested in just doing a little small grow but doing some um, some some product, you know, she does stuff right now with growing hemp and turning it into, you know, CBD cream and things like that, and is interested in doing something like that with cannabis. So they're trying, you know, trying to provide a lot of options and tiers within licensing again to kind of bring the illegal market into the regulated market. And so is this? I mean, it sounds like a lot will rely on the rulemaking to to, to really come down on something, but. This, because this sounds like it's not quite the same as it's definitely not the same as how we control alcohol, right? And it's not quite the same as how we control beer and wine. Um, it's a different. It is definitely its own. It's, it's a different it's tier its own, system. It's its own yeah. thing. I mean, obviously, the biggest difference is the the state is not going to be in possession of the cannabis. We are going to be strictly the regulator. And I think the, the reasons for that are because it's a Schedule One drug. So if you look at Canada, Canada, there's a difference. If you look at Quebec and you go to Quebec, Quebec has they, uh, their alcohol and cannabis is dealt with very similarly in that they have more of a model like what we do, which is they are not the producers, but they are the, they, they, they sell the product. And, and so they have a, con a control model there. But um, that's not really be considered here because I think while you have all these other, you know, much bigger states that are doing, that are participating in, in, in a regulated market by, by 
the, what, the rulemaking, all that, is that um, nobody's probably going to pay that much attention at the federal level to Little Vermont if we had a commercial market. But if all of a sudden Vermont is the distributor of cannabis, you'd probably bump us right up to the top of the list. So, well, that's that's an important fact. I mean, because that's so. What you're saying is that the is that what I heard was that Canada shares a similar model to us with with alcohol, right? Where the manufacturers provide us with the product and we ship it out to, right. the, to the consumers, essentially. We're the middleman, and that's how we control it. Right. And, and what you're saying is that the federal, that because it's still a, a Schedule One drug, that it, not only would it look bad, it would be highly illegal if we were pushers. The state for, would be in violation of the CSA, whereas yeah. right now, because the, um, there's federal and state overlap when it comes to drugs. And the question is, is um, can Vermont regulate cannabis um, uh, for, uh, for, for important state interests? And can it regulate it without creating uh, an impermissible obstacle for the feds to enforce the CSA if they wanted to? So can the two coexist? And I think that if you then have the state actually being in possession and distributing cannabis, um, it, 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 you run into some CSA problems there. So right now, as just looking at it, and again, you know, one of the um, stated purposes of, of the bill and uh, in, it's, it's in here and it's been talked a lot um, about in the Senate and, and in House Gov Ops is, is the idea is that you know because um, cannabis is legal to possess is that you know bring again having a regulated market is in the best interest of the state and Vermonters because of issues around consumer safety and trying to keep it out of the hands of having a regulated market trying to keep it out of the hands of kids and things like that and that you can do that better um, through a regulated market than to just leave it open. The, um, I, I know that there was a discussion in a House version of a uh, bill, not this bill, but I wondered if the Senate looked at this with the having the, the five licensed dispensaries begin to sell marijuana sooner than this. Right. Um, House GovOps is talking about that. That is in um, uh, Representative Young and there's a number of other co-sponsors on that. Um, that does contemplate allowing dispensaries to apply for a temporary license to sell early to the public is they would pay um, a $75,000 uh, fee for a temporary license. Um, they would still have be required to meet all their obligations in terms of serving patients and caregivers under the medical program, but they would be allowed to gear up and, and cultivate and, and develop products to be able to sell to the public for under uh, under 196, H196, it's for 18 months, but now the discussion now is more that it would only be for a year period. And so they would, and that money would go into the <coughs> cannabis regulation fund, which would help fund the board's work, because right now, S54, is it's just borrowing in anticipation of receipts, because you don't have any money coming into the fund until you start collecting application fees, which is in the fall of next year. Um, and so that is being discussed at, at, up in house government operations. What is the practical effect on medical marijuana when all marijuana is legal? Right. Um, it's a, you know, I think people probably differ in their opinion on that. Um, there is language in S54 that I'll show you that talks about, um, it, uh, about the uh, importance of continuing the medical program in order to provide um, uh, goods and services to, uh, to patients that would not otherwise be available through the commercial regulated market, and so there's a list of things. So, you know, one of the things right now is that uh, dispensaries can deliver to patients. Um, delivery is, as right now, as it came over from the Senate, is not allowed in the com in the commercial system. Um, uh, uh, patients are allowed to p uh, purchase more than one ounce, um, so they're allowed to purchase higher amounts. Um, also, they would be allowed to potentially uh, purchase products that have a higher THC content than would be allowed on the commercial market. Um, they would also uh, 
cannabis and cannabis products that are sold uh, by dispensaries are not taxed. Um, cannabis that would be sold on the commercial market would be taxed at, there's a, under the Senate proposal, it's a 16% retail tax plus a potential 2% uh, percent local option. So if you're buying commercial, you have to pay the tax. If you're buying medical, you don't pay the tax. So there are certain benefits um, uh, to that. But I think that's up for debate. I think people would, some people would view and say, well, if you can, if you have dispensaries there, maybe we don't need a med medical program at all. Um, so just on the timeline, is I just want to note, there's like a rolling application period, and that's something that we learned a few years ago from Washington State was the idea that to make sure that you start out issuing people cultivator licenses, you don't just like say everybody come and apply for all these licenses, because then what you wind up with is stores with no product. And so you start out with the cultivators, get them geared up, growing the product. So you start out with cultivators and testing labs, um, and you open that up for a 30-day window. They can always open up that that when, that application period after that. But the I, but the cons the thing that we heard from regulators in other states is that at first, when you're first gearing up, to kind of um, moderate it a little bit so that you just don't get completely overwhelmed by all the applications and, and doing the processing. So there's a rolling application period. Um, and then you'll see basically uh, April 1st of 2021, they begin issuing licenses for retailers and they could start um, selling to the public in April of 2021. Um, so if it's okay with you, I'll just start kind of walking through the bill a little bit? Yeah, and just, um, I think of Deputy Commissioner Kessler's here as well from, from um, DLL, who has a presentation, we just want to get to him as well. So um, just be conscious, we're just sure. going to be conscious of the time, um, say till 25 past. Sure, yeah. definitely, okay. Um, so something uh, that will look familiar to you here at the beginning is, is it's in Title Seven, and so that is, um, um, a, a shift and an intentional shift to, so because cannabis has been treated primarily <coughs> in a criminal context, and that's why I'm working on it, I, you know, I've worked on it for so long on the drug laws, and, and now it doesn't really have much of anything to do with the stuff that I've traditionally worked on any longer, but I'm the, I'm the marijuana attorney in the office, so, I still, so I'm still working on this. <laughs> um, and it's great, because I'm always learning new things. But the idea is to kind of shift it over from something that is illegal, cannot be possessed, you're going to jail for it, to now it's a regulated commodity. And so uh, taking it out of Title 18, you know, people are already, already are like, wait, where do you find the marijuana? Everybody's looking under Title 13, under the criminal laws. So they, they, they can't find an 18 now. So the idea is to shift it over to seven um, and put it in with alcoholic beverages, cannabis, and tobacco. And, and again, the medical program would be shifting under with the board as well eventually. Um, so the Section 2 is just setting up the new cannabis chapter. So you have a lot of the definitions, the definitions for cannabis doesn't change. Again, it's everything under current law, it, it refers to marijuana. There's a section at the end of the bill that directs legislative council this summer to go through all of the titles and to make the terminology change everywhere that's appropriate from marijuana to cannabis. Um, so you'll see cannabis is through this draft. The, the definition of, of cannabis marijuana does not change though. Um, again, just clarifying that when we're talking about cannabis, we're not talking about hemp. Um, cannabis products, um, again, those are something uh, that would be anything from, you know, oils that somebody might vape to a, uh, a lozenge or any type of product that contains cannabis. Um, Good question. Yeah, I just, I just noticed that it def in the definition it defines cannabis sativa, mm -hmm. and there are other strains of cannabis, like indica. Right. And so is that included automatically? Yeah, or it's my, how you, you know, this that? comes up every year and then I always get my answer. Um, but my, <laughs> understand, up my up. understanding <laughs> is that this is correct and this is uh, very closely models the federal definition and talking with Agency of Agriculture that this is the correct one and it encompasses everything we need to encompass. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, there's your definition of public place if anybody <coughs> wants to go back and take a look at that. Um, uh, 
so subchapter two in here is the Cannabis Control Board. As I mentioned, um, they'd be in charge of all three programs. Um, uh, they, the membership is one member who's appointed by the governor who serves as chair and has to have a background in business management or regulatory compliance. One member, uh, Senate Committee on Committees, who has a background in plant science or horticulture. And one member who's appointed by the speaker who has a background in systemic social justice and equity issues. Um, I will say that's definitely something GovOps is talking about there. There's concern that the board maybe <coughs> is a little too small and that maybe those specific things for those particular offices maybe makes it a little too narrow. Um, so that's being debated upstairs. Um, and then just a lot about how you fill vacancies, how you remove someone, you can't have conflicts of interest, so I can't be on the board and my husband working for a cannabis company, that sort of thing. Um, Salaries, um, their full-time positions. Uh, the uh, chair receives compensation equal to two-thirds of a superior court judge, which I think puts it at around 105 right now. And other members receive compensation equal to one half of that. So, like 80 or so would be the so for the chair 105, and for others 80. Um, then the executive director. Um, and the, that matches what? Does that match with the public utilities? Commission how they're paid as well, or is that a different scale? I do not know. Okay. I think they are, aren't they tracked more with the judge's <coughs> salary? Or That's what I'm asking. I, mean, I, I mean, I, I, I know that there's a differential. I know that the, the, the formula is, is kind of like looking at like Green Mountain Care Board, but Green Mountain Care Board, the chair is the same as the Superior Court judge, and then the other members are two thirds. So it's kind of like right, that. Right, you're just using that. Yeah. Salary level as a benchmark. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, executive director uh, is to be an attorney with experience in legislative or regulatory matters. This was an issue that came up again, like in Senate appropriations. They were concerned that there just wasn't going to be enough enough people <coughs> to be able to pull off this Herculean task they have to do in the first couple of years. And so they said, well, maybe we can kind of combine the idea of a general counsel and executive director in one. And so you have the executive director needs to be an attorney. Um, they're allowed to hire consultants. Um, gives them authority for criminal background checks. So throughout the system, whether you're talking about a cannabis establishment in the commercial system or a dispensary, um, anyone who is an, either an applicant or an employee of, of those places has to have uh, fingerprint supported criminal background checks and so this gives the board the authority to be working with BCIC within DPS to be doing those background checks. The Cannabis Regulation Fund, um, this is where all of the fees go. So all the fees for all three programs go there. So you have the application fees and the annual fees and the renewal fees for under the commercial system. Um, the fees support the work of the board. The tax money goes to general funds. So this is the Senate proposal, is that none of the tax money goes into this fund. And the fund is only used for supporting the regulatory work. Um, section three is just implementation. This just talks about the initial kind of startup uh, term so that you don't have everybody roll off the board at the same time and lose all that institutional knowledge. Um, section 4 has them initiate rulemaking by October 15th of this year. Again, because there's going to, it's such a heavy lift and it's going to be, you know, at a minimum 10 to 12 months, you know, and that's with a lot of fingers crossed that they can get all these rules up and done by then. It just directs them to get on the stick. <laughs> Is there a, um, any um, cost, startup cost figures being discussed? There is an, uh, there is an uh, appropriation, there's borrowing mm -hmm. and anticipation of receipts for $810,000 that's in the bill appropriation. Um, so section five, I already mentioned this a little bit, executive director comes back with a proposal for all the different fees, because again, the General Assembly has to establish the fees, it's not gonna be the board. Um, subsection B is a list of other things that they would be coming back on. As I mentioned, um, resources necessary for implementation of the, the second year rollout um, and how they might be able to work with existing agencies and coupling with them on some particular things where there may be expertise overlap. 
Um, there's, they have to come back with a proposal to work with various agencies on uh, developing outreach training and employment programs focused on providing economic opportunities for uh, individuals who have been uh, historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. Um, they have to look at the delivery issues and how is that going in other states. And they have to look at whether money is expected to be generated by the fees are actually enough to kind of support the work of the board and the whole regulatory structure, whether or not there's going to have to be some shift and change for some of the tax money to go to support it. Yes, John. Who, who in Vermont would be the populations? Uh, I, if you scroll up again. Yep. Uh, They're going to have to figure that out. The disproportion of the impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is something in, um, you know, it is definitely a <coughs> growing trend in, in yes. the other regulated states, and um, I think it might be more easily identifiable to particular communities and communities mm -hmm. of color and, and actual geographic communities yeah. and things like that. Perhaps in other states, it's maybe a little less clear, but um, but they they that's for the board to okay. identify. Yeah. And then the. When you said the money goes to the general fund. Mm -hmm. The tax money. The tax money, yeah. Mm -hmm. So will, will we then get the education dollars out of the general fund to help do all the work around the, the issues around marijuana for young people, that all the education? Right, that is. Did that come out of the general fund? Or? Right. That was the intention for the, for the senators was that the idea is that the legislature makes the determination every year yes. about, you know, out of this pot of money, how much are we going to spend <coughs> on prevention and education, okay. how much will we spend on law enforcement, how do that, and the idea was that half the tax money go there, and then the General Assembly will decide how much to, to funnel into the different programs rather than earmarking. So previous proposals and some of the bills that had passed the Senate in earlier bienniums um, earmarked and said, here's a fund, it goes into this fund. This amount goes here, this amount right. goes there, this bill does not do that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so page 12, section 6A, there's just something there for BGS has to make sure that there's space and everything they need to get going. There's the appropriation for 810,000 um, appropriated to the fund um, and then to the board and it's made in anticipation of receipts so you're borrowing. Um, there's a section here on uh, if there is uh, a deficit at the end of fiscal year 2022, um, then however much is in there in, in the red, that money um, from the tax gets shifted over to fill that hole in the fund. Section D is a, is a report back from the auditor of accounts. Um, looking at whether or not the structure of the board that's initially geared towards getting it started, does that still make sense, you know, a few years down the road once the program is running? Does it still make sense to have that three-member board, and, or is there, should there be a restructuring? Should it look somehow different? So Section 7 is really the heart of it around the regulation of the cannabis establishments. Um, we've already talked, I'll just scan through the... the definitions. Um, so here for regulation by local governments um, is where I think the GovOps committee wanted some input specifically from y'all. Um, so right now the proposal is that um, if a municipality does not want to uh, host a cannabis establishment, um, that they would opt out and they would do that through uh, through voting at either the annual or special meeting. Um, and they can prohibit either all cannabis establishments in the municipality or they could just prohibit a, a particular type. So maybe they're okay with having a cultivator, but they don't want a retail outlet in, their, in the store. So they could put that specifically there um, and they could gear it towards that. Um, and that that is, remains in effect unless it's uh, until it's rescinded by majority of the voters. Um, they also, um, if there is one, uh, they don't opt out and they have one operating that gets licensed and is operating in the municipality, they can't then put it on the ballot vote and then say, you got to pack up and we can get out. So it doesn't mean necessarily that, I mean, that, that operation will still have to go through and get its annual 
license renewal at the state level and if they have been requiring a permit or license at the local level they'll still have to go through and comply be in compliance but if they're otherwise in compliance you can't vote and then and then they can push them out. license for being bad business people but not right Right. Representative Zott and Toronto. I just had a question about the re whether the bill addresses retail operations. Does it anticipate that they are at a fixed location? In other words, could you have a mobile retail operation? Um, no, I don't think that that's been contemplated in this. Uh, you mean like they would just be at a different location? Um, uh, yeah. As we no. were discussing the farm stand model, the food right. truck model, where you've got a controlled right. space right. With, with access that you control, mm -hmm. um, but you're not at a fixed address, and so any municipality that hasn't opted out, would you have right. to go get, you know, licenses in each of those spots? Yeah, right. I would say that that kind of um, has not, that's not addressed in this, but it doesn't really seem to fit with the other, it's not specifically prohibited or, or contemplated, mm -hmm. but it, um, I think that the, the uh, intention is that this would be a fixed location. So you wouldn't be able to do anything like an off-site catering license for like a wedding or a special event? No, there was some discussion in the Senate about <laughs> perhaps having a... I was just saying, like, yeah. Yeah. Treat it like alcohol. Right. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, one of the things was that was talked about, and specifically around like alcohol, was whether or not you could have um, a uh, something like a cater something like that license, or you could have a special event license. Mm. So let's say if um, <coughs> you know is having a you know a, a big party at Top Notch or or some you know resort, they're a public accommodation. They're not allowed to allow consumption of cannabis on the property, exactly. right? Could they, either <coughs> I as the person who is having the event, or could Top Notch as the place that is hosting the event, could they apply for some type of license that would allow them an exemption from the public consumption law for particular events? And um, so there was some interest in the, in the Senate in that, but not enough, and so there wasn't, so they, they, did, they did not include that. But that has been part of the discussion, because um, certainly with Vermont being a tourist-based economy and the ban, complete ban, on um, public consumption, and there are certainly um, some businesses that are interested in, being allo in allowing their, uh, their customers to be able to consume at, at, on the premises. Yeah, because consumption of cannabis at, a, at an event where they're serving alcohol under, with, with a license, puts right. that license in jeopardy. Right, yeah. right, right. And there's also been talk about the idea that, let's say, you'd, if you had a hotel where you had like Sugar Bush, you had a resort or something, and you and they wanted to actually provide for provide product or like kind of like a combination, allowing for consumption on premises. So the idea, so uh, Massachusetts has the ability and the authority to issue. Um, I can't remember what they're calling it, but uh, people, you know, call it like cannabis cafes or cannabis lounges, some place where you could purchase and consume on site because at these retail facilities you can't consume on site. Um, but some place where you could go and purchase, so like a, you know, just like a bar, a wine bar or something like that. And again, that's part of the discussion, but it didn't, it didn't make it into this version. But there has been interest in it. Chip, you have a question? Um, yeah, I'm looking through this highlighted section. Um, is there a provision for local taxes uh, uh, by communities on retailers? Yes, that's later on, and so okay. there's a local option of, of 2%. So if you're going to okay. have a retailer, you can have a 2% local option tax. Thank you. Yep. John. And the, um, the five dispensaries now, mm -hmm. the cities didn't vote to allow them in, did they? Um, they, it's not an opt-in, um, but they can, they could, they do have authority to, to, to not have them in their town. And so they've gone through the local zoning and, and processes. So I live in South Burlington, mm -hmm. there's a dispensary there. Mm -hmm. So did South Burlington voters have to approve no. that? No. No. But South Burlington had to approve it for a license or? Uh, no, I don't think they, no. they had to, whatever their municipal authority is with regard to, you have to address these issues in order as any other business to work in our town as they worked with the dispensary on that okay. in, compli in compliance with that. So There's this, not a this would be different then. The, what, the, what 
is the idea about the opt out. Right now, there's not a mechanism for yeah. for medical to for towns to vote and say no way you can't come in. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So subsection B is that a municipality uh, that decides they're going to have a cannabis establishment can have a local cannabis control commission. My understanding is that that is you know the intention is to mirror the local. Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission. Um, one little difference is that under liquor, it says they have to be the members of the municipal legislative body. Senate GovOps said who may be members, so they didn't require, so there's just a slight difference there. Um, and then the local commission can administer permits um, for them. Um, they can condition the issuance of the permits upon compliance with any bylaws adopted under current law or ordinances regulating signs or public nuisances under current law. They can suspend or revoke the permits for violations. Um, it would have the board, Cannabis Control Board, adopting rules relating to the municipality's issuance of local permits. Again, my understanding is that mirrors the way that they do it now, so it's that it's a liquor control board that has to adopt the rules with regard to the municipalities and then the board would be uh, adopting all the forms for those municipal licenses as well. Subsection C is just the kind of belts and suspenders language, um, which is just saying that essentially a municipality can't exceed its authority given to it either under this act or under existing law with regard to what it can do and what it can't do. So one thing that we've seen like after um, the Senate bills had gotten some traction a few years ago. There were a few towns that adopted ordinances that said, if marijuana establishments ever become legal, they're not going to be legal here, and um, and you can't you can't do that. Um, so, so that's. Um, but the voters can. But the voters can yes. Okay. But you couldn't adopt an ordinance yes. and say you have to take it to the voters. Thank you. Um, there's provisions on advertising, education, um, rulemaking is really, you know, there's a ton here on rulemaking for all the different, so all the stuff that people think about in terms of labeling and testing and pesticides and carding people and all of that kind of stuff, it's all under rulemaking, so you can review those. I'm happy to talk to people offline about this anytime you want, so there's rules uh, for all of the establishments, and then it goes through and says, here's the rules with the, you know, specifically with cultivators. Here's the rules specifically with product manufacturers. Uh, just briefly, is there a, um, a testing, a lab, a lab testing for mold and uh, yep. safety of product and rules? Okay, that's yep. as far as I can. Yep. yep. So um, let me see. Yeah, I can show you. So that stuff. There's process for suspension and revocation of licenses. I already mentioned the criminal background checks. Um, everybody that works in one of these establishments has to have an ID card that you work there. Um, you know that will ha allow you access into certain places um, that other people wouldn't be able to go. Um, there's more information about the licenses, the different types of licenses. So this is all stuff that the commission, that the control commission would use as their. Yep. Foundations for mm -hmm. setting up the rules. Right. Um, there's provisions on the license uh, qualifications. Really, you just have to be 21 years of age and consent to the criminal records there and, um, and go through a fingerprint. There are a list of priorities you might want to take a look at in Section 903. <coughs> um, so these are not requirements, but they, you know, you get extra points with regard to your license for this, especially if there's a limited number of licenses. Things like being having a majority of folks associated with as uh, as the applicants with being residents of Vermont, if you're an existing dispensary in good standing, um, there would be a preference for you. If you're fostering social justice and equity by being a minority or women-owned business, so there's a list of priorities there that they will consider and adopt some rules are on. And then after they go through and they say exactly each type of license, this is what you get to do under that. Um, so. Chip, I'll just show you on the testing starts on page 35, so you can see all the different types they might things they might be testing. You know, residual solvents, poisons, toxins, harmful chemicals, all of those types of things. And so, no, the testing laboratory is that the assumption that it's a, a private laboratory that someone would get a license in order to run. Yes, and this would be addition, and this is separate and apart from the ag lab that would be doing. You know, my I would anticipate that what the board's going to come back to, they're not going to say. 
I would, I would, I would just be shocked if they said, well, we need our own laboratory to do compliance testing, right? So, it, so there's things in here that say, you know, you, you're going to have to, you can't have more, you know, than um, 10 milligrams of THC in a serving that you're going to sell on the retail market, right? And so somebody, regulators are going to want to be doing compliance testing on some of those things and on making sure that the labeling is correct to what they're, what they're, what they're selling, right? My, I would anticipate that they're going to be partnering up with the agri agriculture laboratory that has the capacity to be able to do that kind of testing and do compliance testing. So compliance testing is different than this individual's is that you're going to have all of these people growing and people selling is that they're going to have some testing requirements. They're going to be wanting to test their own products. They're not, you can't have everybody on the commercial market going and trying to access the ag lab to be able to have, make sure that they, you know, they think that there's 10 milligrams in this, but they're not sure. So right now the dispensaries do their own testing to make sure that they're accurate with, with regard to um, what they're required to do under so current laws. So this is laws. different than, right, so this is going to be different than the labeling, the average when, or will it be different from, say, I have to tell you that my marijuana has, my cannabis has X amount of THC in it. I'm assuming that's a labeling requirement. It's a labeling level. requirement, but you want to make sure that you're being accurate there. So you're probably contracting with a testing lab to, you know, or maybe you have a testing, you know, the testing lab equipment is very expensive. And so the idea is that you would have these testing labs that could get licensed and then serve a lot of other licensees. Um, is there going to be any oversight for the private testing labs? I know at West that there's been issues with dispensaries working with less than, uh, I guess, I don't want to say above board, but they've been manipulating THC content right. um, well, to be inaccurate with what right. they're selling to the public, trying to Hopefully, you know, the, the, this is intended that there's going to be the oversight of the board. And maybe, the, again, the board might be saying, well, maybe we will have, rather than our own people, maybe we're going to par partner with Agency of Agriculture to be doing independent verification of the metrics that those, yeah. that those labs are using. Um, and there's legislation in S-117, which is a medical marijuana bill that's up in human services now, that expands the ability for the ag lab. Right now, they have the ability to be doing all of that. <laughs> Um, with regard to hemp, and it expands it to cannabis, and it also says there that the ag lab can certify local testing facilities now to be doing some of this stuff, uh, you need know, certain <coughs> criteria. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so where are we, Michelle? I, just want to I know, I want it. so I just the rulemaking, the money, mostly after this, it's just the money, which I kind of talked a little bit about the tax money, um, the medical and dispensary programs. It would just be um, kind of a scaled down adoption of those of, of those programs that would take effect in January 1st, 2021, and those programs would shift over to the board at that time. Um, but most of the rest part is is taxation um, provisions. So for us, so for us though, for based on the little while that was just the highlighted material was simply about local licensing or the local board stuff. I think that there's also um, the issue that, that we can discuss is the, the locations, what, what Representative Zah was talking about. Like right, certain types of licenses. I think they were just trying to think about the li the way that you operate and have knowledge around licensing for, for, uh, well, for, it'll for be, alcohol. And I think we should come back to this when we do come back to this and review the, mm -hmm. the seed, to, seed to consumer mm -hmm. process. I think that's something that is you know, and when we talk about control, uh, again, whether it's a three-tiered system right. or whether it's our alcohol control system, that there, we have an interest in just seeing how does it get from from the beginning to the end. Right. And so, um, so let's leave your work done. Thank sure. you for coming up. Sure. And um, we may call you back if we if sure. when we need to. Okay, to I'll stick to around us. for the next testimony. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Oh, there we are. So I'll, I'll just uh, start by saying that I, I was fairly active on the um, tax and regulate committee that met over the last, I don't know, 12 or 14, 16 months, whatever it was. And this was one, a, pre a version of the presentation that I had provided to them. I'll say from the outset that 
um, I've been very busy with uh, running the lottery as well as working on liquor, so I have not been uh, as engaged in um, the legislation that's moved on, on cannabis uh, this year. So it's, you know, it was, it was great to hear some overview. I haven't had a chance to look at it a few times as it's moved its way through. Um, you know, one of the, the, the proposals that I had, or I, it was more of an educational opportunity uh, for the Tax and Regulate Committee was just to talk about um, the control model because they're not as familiar with it as all of you are, um, having you know been on this committee. There was a really diverse group of people that were on this Tax and Regulate group, and so this was really supposed to be educational for them. I, I feel at this point it seems like the, the ship has sailed to a, to a large degree on the state's involvement in it. I, I will say I find it, I mean, I think there's a I propose one workaround, which is that there be a separate sort of a cannabis authority that would be somewhat removed from state government, with the, pen, the benefits going um, to you know to the state essentially, maybe even a, some kind of liquor lottery authority as well that would you know move things away from um, direct state oversight and control, but members of the board would be appointed by the governor. That that's one component. I do find it odd that. Um, if the state were involved, I think it, at some level we would have more control than these states that have more of an open market system. So I don't know whether we'd really, I, I heard the testimony that we, we might move to the top of uh, DOJ's hit list because the state is somehow engaged in the, in the business, but every one of the states that is involved with um, a tax and regulate model is taking money from this industry. So it's really hard for me to say that there's this giant separation um, in the end, but an authority might, you know, might be one solution if there's a solution needed. I, and maybe the view is now there isn't. So let's see if I can. Uh, I, I will skip the DLC fast facts components because this committee hears from us regularly and knows something about uh, about the department and and uh, you know how we how we function. Um, the one point I would make is that the department. Uh, does do all of its duties, including all the all the regulation, um, all the oversight, all the law enforcement officers that we have. Everything is paid for by our revenue. Nothing comes from the general fund. No money is expended in our department on the liquor or the lottery side, but specifically on the liquor side um, from you know from from the general fund, uh, effectively. So I think in some ways that's a really nice model, um, in that the revenue are what's paying for the operation of of the department. So just, uh, I'll, I'll jump quite a ways into it here, and again, the presentation is available. I think it's pretty... Well, to, to that mm -hmm. point, though, mm -hmm. to, before you pass that by, mm -hmm. the, con the bill contemplates that fees raised through licensing would pay for the Cannabis Control Board. The fees that you receive are treated how differently than than um, than income that's then used to do the overhead of the of the department. So the fees that we receive aren't really what's paying for the department operations. I mean, they're they're helpful, and I I I, can, I like the model where uh, people are paying a fee to get a license that corresponds to what it actually costs the department to issue that license. So much more like a business model than we see other places in state government. The majority of our revenue is coming from the benefit of the profit that we make. Um, through the sale of the product, so that's the that's the money that's essentially paying for the departmental operations. If we're talking just about licensing, uh, then you know we have tried to get to the point where the money that we charge for a license for some particular activity should cover our costs to um, issue that license. And we've talked around, and, and uh, but I just haven't had time to get to it. But the idea of having more of a variable license fee structure. So if someone's applying for a license the first time. We have to do a background check. We do a lot more work on that, a new license. But for a license that is just being renewed, that's less work for us. So uh, somebody who's applying for just a renewal with no change in ownership, no additional owners, that would be easier for us to issue. We could charge a smaller fee for that. Again, trying to reflect the actual costs. But most of our, our revenue that we're spending uh, on our law enforcement side, uh, where we do a lot of our compliance work, is um, paid for via the profits that we uh, that we earn so just a, a little bit of you know about prohibition there's a, a you know a nice little quote that uh, predicted um, very wrongly um, that you know all the problems in the United States would be over if we just had prohibition um, you know that they could and in fact some some jurisdictions did sell their their correctional facilities they just didn't believe they'd be needed anymore after alcohol was prohibited um, and then uh, you know, I, again, maybe a bit naive, but the promises were out there, as, as are often made. Um, I thought this quote was, was, was also quite helpful. Um, you know, it shows that really th things were worse 
um, at the end, you know, uh, as a result of prohibition, not not really better, um, and that you know, ending prohibition would put things on a better track. And and you you all have seen the book towards you know towards the model towards control, which I know you have in your bookshelf here somewhere. Um, in in any event, um, that. I think there was the realization at the time that we were going to get back to a legalized um, marketplace for alcohol, so um, the effort was on to come up with a model that might work. I think one of the fears with the open market model is that there's just a there's an, a component of, of pushing the product on people. And one thing I'll, I mean I think is true in Vermont, and I think is true in all the control states, is while we do do some advertising, we don't have these price wars. Um, we're not, you know, I don't feel like we're um, in the same range as, as uh, you know, work the same way as if you go down to Massachusetts and there's a liquor store on most corners in downtown Boston um, because, you know, it's very competitive industry. Here, whether you're in Brattleboro or Burlington, you pay exactly the same price for alcohol across the board. And one of the other benefits to our, our model as it exists now is if you're a local producer of alcohol in Vermont, we will work to carry your product in our stores, make sure it gets highlighted. And I think that's a real plus is that we're really encouraging local producers to be involved in the market. Um, if it's a, not a control model, those, those small producers have to fight for an inch of shelf space um, because there's just no, not really an incentive. And we talked about this in the Tax and Regulate um, group as well, which is the idea that trying to encourage small producers in Vermont to be able to engage in the market in a meaningful way, the control state model at some level would allow for that. We would be encouraging it. While when you when you have more of an open market model, uh, if I if I can hold a license at every tier, then I want to just primarily sell what I produce because that's what I'll make the most money on, right? I mean, I make that. I can control all the costs on that. And if you come to me and say you're a small producer, why would I want to carry your product? I mean, if it's not any different than what I'm I'm selling, or not enough different that there's demand, I'm just going to sell what I produce, and that will effectively push the small producers really, I think, out to the margins, or we'll have to come up with some other creative way to try to get them engaged in, in, in the market. So that's some of the, you know, there's the, there's a copy of the cover of the book. I don't know if you, I know you have it somewhere, but yeah. Um, anyway, um, I, I, again, trying to go through this fairly quickly because I know your time is limited, but um, the, the goal of the three-tier system was to, to prevent this um, vertical integration that we have. And I think on the medical side, that makes perfect sense uh, because there weren't other ways to you know, get the product produced and, and, and to the patients that needed it. But uh, one, of the, one of the things that was identified, and, and you've heard these terms talked about in the committee, a tide house. Right, that's a that's a, a, a was a business that uh, maybe I had a bar and also was the producer of the of the, the product that sold in the bar and was also the distributor. So they're occupying every single tier, uh, and and of course the only product they would sell would be the product that they produced, not their competitor's product, because that doesn't help them in the end. And so again, I think that was one of the fears, one of the things that I thought was a benefit to the control state model was that we we wouldn't have um, these tied houses. Uh, on, on the cannabis side, so you wouldn't have somebody who is a large producer, maybe a national producer. I mean, it maybe we'll get to the point that this will be uh, legal nationally, and then will we allow you know product to come from California, from other parts of the country, and it will just inundate our market. And, and in, as it is now in some of the states out west, they have um, much more production than they have capacity to sell. There aren't as many cons customers. Um, to buy all the product that was being overproduced, they'd love to sell it into other states. Obviously, in the end, and and does that you know put our producers at a real uh, large disadvantage, effectively as far as access to the market goes? Um, so again, trying to go through this fairly quickly, there was the Rand study a while back that showed um, how much money would you know could potentially be raised in the state. I don't know whether that's <coughs> still really valid. Um, one of the goals of the control state model is the idea of social responsibility, not just profitability. And so that is different than, than a regular open um, you know, state model that we see on alcohol or that you might see on cannabis. It's, it's, a, it's about making as much money as possible. That's what business does for the most part. But on the control state model, we're happy to sell you a, uh, an adult use product, but we're not trying to push it on you. Uh, and I think that's that is very different. And you won't you don't see there's no price wars on spirits in Vermont because we set the price and it's the same everywhere. If you have an open market, um, which this will be more like, I think you're more likely to see that one store is going to offer something for less money to try to get more people to buy from them um, effectively. So um, 
So again, I have any other states gone with the control market? Canada. It's not a state, but but as a country, um, and and the, the provinces there have have um, t have gone more for the control model, which you heard some testimony about. And it is a, just like the control model here in the United States on alcohol, and Canada is also a control um, country and province on alcohol. Everyone's a little bit different, and everyone in Canada is a little bit different too. They're not doing it exactly the same way. Um, I, I would say that if we had something like a control model here, we would use an agency model like we have now for alcohol. So it wouldn't be the state doing the retailing. It would just be the state involved in the, in the distribution, making sure that local uh, small producers were actually in the market, had access to the market, um, and that we had uniform pricing across the board, um, and not have these, you know, these these varied prices as again as a way to try to get people um, into the market and and then try to win market share as a um, as a consequence. Again, the I, you know kind of highlight here some of the some of the drawbacks to the um, you know open market model in in general. Um, and you know, again, selling as much as you can, um, encouraging people to consume, encouraging younger people to be interested in consuming, which you know we saw on the tobacco tobacco side of things, or recently in the in you know uh, vaping side of things. You know, they're appealing to a younger market. We really don't see that kind of advertising in Vermont on alcohol because we just don't allow it effectively. So that's one of the you know one of the uh, benefits. One of the other big benefits of the control model is really tax collection. And that was one of the reasons it came in place is because if the if the state is involved, um, it knows exactly how much is being sold and distributed and make sure that the, the taxes are collected. Um, when you have an open model and especially when you have a vertically integrated model, the ability to really know what's being sold and uh, how much is, is is really difficult. You're just relying on honest reporting um, you know from whoever's in the, in the industry. So uh, I'm not really opposed to the control model that you present, but I'm just not, uh, speaking of, of uh, market, um, I think alcohol is sold by more by preference rather than quality. Um, so that when you talk about a, a stable pricing situation to the state, I, I start to think that, well, you know, uh, cannabis and quality is more, much more varied, varied than it is in alcohol, and I think that trying to trying to uh, put a stable market price on everything would not particularly work in a cannabis market as opposed to alcohol, because people are going to choose it as quality, as THC content. I mean, there are a number of different um, elements that would, a person would choose in buying cannabis that they wouldn't particularly. Uh, Choose in, in an alcohol. Well, I, I would. I, I'm not sure. I, I agree with that 100. percent I mean, you can you can uh, come to one of our stores and you can buy a 10 high bourbon, which is uh, you know sort of on the bottom shelf and pretty inexpensive, or you can buy a bottle that costs 2,500 dollars. Well, so I there's yeah, yeah there, there's there's quite a wide range, and you know there's room in the market for for both. So if you're a small sort of boutique producer and you produce something really different, that you, you could you could set a higher price for it, and then the price that we charge on the alcohol side is based on, on the wholesale price that we, right. we purchase on, and then there's a markup put on top of that. So there'd still be every opportunity for someone who's a small producer who um, makes something really different to be able to set a different, and maybe it costs more to produce it, set a different uh, wholesale price that then would be um, reflected in the retail price. So I think, I think there's still plenty of room for that. It wouldn't be like... Uh, you know, any flour you buy is going to cost X per gram. That wouldn't be how it is. It, there'd be, okay. you know, opportunity to create a brand for yourself, which I think is another goal for small producers, right? They want to be able to create a brand for themselves, mm -hmm. not just I just produce something that gets turned into oil or um, you know some other product. That so, clarifies. Yeah, Thank you. Right. And then I, I think um, one of the goals again of the control state model initially, when when prohibition ended, was to end the illegal production. Um, and sale of alcohol, and that obviously worked quite successfully. I, I get uh, alcohol <laughs> newsletters every single day, being in the alcohol industry. I get a lot of cannabis <laughs> newsletters too, um, and it's, it's really interesting to read them. But one thing that, that you see that we don't hear so much about here in the United States, and if we do hear about it, it's not because it involves American citizens. But um, in other parts of the world, people are regularly getting alcohol that kills them. Um, or blinds them or sends hundreds of people to the hospital. I'd say every week or so, there's some story, whether it's out of India or out of Russia or somewhere else, uh, Indonesia, where people are getting alcohol that's, that's, that's poisonous. Um, and so that's you know, really one of the pluses is that we've ensured that we have safety in the, you know, in the market. 
Um, and so I think that's, that's one plus for the control model. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the, when control model first came in, they wanted to get rid of uh, the illegal production and sale. And there's a real incentive on the state side to be sure that we, we end the black market because black market sellers will sell to anyone who has the money. Um, and they'll sell whatever you want if they if they have it. So you know maybe it's cannabis today and something else uh, tomorrow. Um, they have no problem selling to young consumers who might be interested by trying to push the black market away uh, and having more of a, a, a flexible pricing model that would make the product um, that is sold in the stores more desirable than what you could buy in the street corner um, or from a friend. Um, maybe there'd still be the friend uh, you know, transactions, and I think that, that's fine, just like home brewing. But the idea is that there'd be enough selection in our stores um, in Vermont and, and that the price would be fair, uh, and that you know the product is safe for you to consume, that people would want to buy in those locations rather than from somebody out of the back of their car or that you meet somewhere else. So I think that you know that's another plus of the control model is the elimination of the black market. I, I, I would say that an open market would love the black market to go away, but whether they'll price at a level or have an incentive to do that um, is a little bit unclear. Um, so there's that. I'm trying to see, back, again, just go through this quickly. One of the benefits of the control model, as we've seen, is we, we do maximize profitability for the state. So you know we, we can deal with some of the negatives uh, through the, the, the uh, additional revenue that's you know that's produced through the control model that you you, you won't have so much on on the, on the open model so there's a, a, a list of some of the benefits I think I mentioned uh, most of them um, again more about the small producers on this particular slide um, you know some of the efforts that we make to make sure that uh, underage people are getting uh, getting this this product and the educational efforts we make as well um, which I don't know if it's contemplated in the bill, but one of the things that we do for alcohol is everybody who's a gatekeeper, everybody who sells alcohol, whether it's a, a bartender, a wait staff, somebody at a convenience store, every one of those people has been trained um, to know when not to sell. And um, I think that's an important consideration. I, again, I don't know if it's in the present bill, but I think having educational, uh, an educational component for whoever's in the industry um, would, be, you know, would be really helpful. Uh, to be sure that we're not selling to the wrong, wrong uh, customers um, in the end. So that was really quick. I said I'd do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> and, I really, and I appreciate that. The, um, that, last, that last note up on the top just um, actually speaks a little bit to what we were discussing earlier about um, the local control model that allows for five towns. How does that work now? How does it work now? Um, when Prohibition ended, uh, all, a town had to had to positively decide that they wanted to um, allow alcohol sales and, or, or production. Um, and that, that is still the case. So uh, there was, a, a, I think, a town recently, um, and it was a news story because there's not, nothing in the, there's no stores in the town now, but they did um, approve, uh, eliminate the prohibition. So um, that town is no longer a dry town. Um, it's a wet town. We have dry towns. We have semi-dry towns. Um, they only allow a sale of, of beer and wine, but not spirits. Um, so it, it, it really varies. And that's in your, it's still in your annual report? It is in our annual report. I think uh, the report is a few, that one town has changed, and there was one other town that was reported as, um, as listed as a dry town. But when we went back and did some research af after the report was completed, I learned that the town had changed uh, had, had voted in a number of years ago and changed, but we didn't know about it. So um, they, they actually have a, 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 a distiller that is selling there, so that's how we know that it's okay with the town. So, so in this, um, Michelle, I didn't include you in this question. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, now about control and, 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 and how to distribute into the market. We've talked about um, regulation to a degree. What about enforcement? Um, the, does the does the bill as written S fifty four as written contemplate <coughs> enforcement, or is it just simply because it's part of DLL that the existing DLL enforcement um, would would apply? No, um, it's specifically that the board would would handle compliance and enforcement. There is not the positions or structure set up in this for, for that. So they're going to be doing it some through rulemaking and then also with the ED coming back to the legislature next year with the build out for for the for the positions and the resources necessary for enforcement. So it may be that their recommendation is to utilize some of what DLL has or to mirror it within the board or but that's not 
Okay, so that would be determined. Yep. Um, I would say just one of the things that we, we do, so everyone knows, is we do these compliance uh, tests at, at, uh, our, at retailers. And so we have underage, uh, whether it's for tobacco, under 18 um, or under 21, that go in and try to purchase product um, in an effort to make sure that the training that these people have all gotten are actually being complied with and that they're not selling to people that shouldn't have access to the product. So that's one of the things. And obviously that would be important, I think, on, on the cannabis side as well, to uh, be sure that for, for adult use it is being just sold to adults and not to anybody who walks in the store. Um, so I was just Michelle, then Tom, then I was going to mention. Tom. So there are, with regard to what the board has to come up with, uh, rule regulations with regard to training for for employees who are going to be working at, at these establishments, as well as all the compliance and the enforcement pieces. And I think just to, and so everybody has been talking about that as something that is essential, and that there's a lot to be looking to the liquor, uh, the liquor department with regard to um, how they do it. Um, but because revenue will not be coming in at all to fund any of this until the second fiscal year of this operation. The idea was not to, is, and they're having to borrow anticipation or receipts for the 800,000 is not to, and because you don't need those compliance positions or those training positions, or you don't need any of that for, for the next fiscal year because it's really just gonna be focused on building the structure and you don't need any of those new employees to process applications, to do spot checks, to do any of that stuff until FY 2021 is it's not in this, but it is contemplated. And so maybe if it's not as clear to people, maybe that's something that needs to be kind of bulked up a little bit so that it doesn't get overlooked. Sure, Representative Walls and Kalaki. Uh, uh, maybe it's just a question for you. Uh, I'm just wondering, <coughs> in the discussion in S54, <coughs> excuse me, if there was any reasoning for creating this separate control board instead of folding it into the Department of Liquor and Pottery where we have so many mechanisms already right. in place. I think it's because um, previous versions of, uh, of a TNR system have um, looked to other existing agencies to do it. So first it was, the first ones, bills that were being considered were to have it within DPS because DPS already has the medical program. And then folks said, well, it doesn't really fit generally with their mission and maybe it's, maybe the medical program has our own DPS. And then they looked to Agency of Agriculture. So subsequent bills were looking at agriculture because there's a lot of things that will be overlapping with agriculture. And then when Massachusetts came online, here was this model of an independent commission, which was appealing to, to senators and then also to House members that introduced 146 of the idea of that you're not kind of trying to shoehorn it into an existing agency, but you have a, arguably a politically independent board that operates that then would be able to perhaps learn from the experiences of and utilize services of other agencies, but there was concern that if you housed it within one agency and had different agencies doing different pieces that you might have a kind of a little bit of a bureaucratic octopus if you had too many hands in the pot and if you had it centralized and then had coordination and you know kind of maybe paralleling in some systems and you you know and that 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 might be a more efficient way to operate it so representative Clark. same question i had thank you I'm good. And, and I think that you, you spoke to this earlier, that there's language in there that will review the need for the Cannabis Commission after a certain amount of time right. to see then if it's, Is if, it the it, most if it gets merged right. into, you know, you know, if it does its job to set up the industry and then it can be subsumed someplace else. Right. I think that's in the language. Yes, and the auditors to report back in 20, 2023. Yeah. That's kind of an answer, an answer to my question. So the board would have the um, consideration and option to move into liquor and lottery for um, purposes of um, control and distribution. Is that what I heard? Uh, what do you mean? Well, not on their own. You guys would have to do that. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, no, you guys would have to approve anything like that, but they can okay. make the recommendation. Yes, okay. Um, they yes. could say the, the functions are so similar, it mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. that it would be housed within, <coughs> you know, an existing agency rather than being <coughs> in, independent. Okay, um, but not an option in this, in this bill. No, the board wouldn't have yeah. the, okay. the authority to do that on their own. Okay. Thank you. But did I understand that there also is hesitancy because it's not 
federally allowed to have Vermont be a control state? Did you say well, that I think that's generally why people have not pursued the control <coughs> model, okay. is that there are no, no other jurisdictions that are doing the control model, and there is concern about uh, federal interference with a, with a state program right. if there was a control model. Got it. Thanks. And, so. and again, that was the, the, the agency, the, the idea of having authority. I mean, it's, it's sort of somewhat separated. I don't know. We, we talked about that, but I don't know whether anybody got more into it than just a suggestion on my part. So. Right. And, and of the states that you mentioned, the only one that's that rings out as a as still a control state is Oregon. Um, it's an alcohol control state. I don't. I mean, we'd have to see what. I know that they've actually had a lot of problems with how many licenses retail. I mean, there's everybody has growing pains. Yes. Um, and Washington is no longer an alcohol control state, so they would handle it differently than than what what could be contemplated here by. One other thing I'd, I'd just add is that, you know, again, as you can see on the control state model for alcohol that we have in Vermont, we have a limited number of retail stores. The idea is to meet um, the needs of our, of our customers um, in a geographic area. When you open things up, you, you know, you just end up with retail stores on, on multiple street corners and, you know, a lot of focus, say, in a big city like Burlington. Um, and, and less focus on more rural areas. And again, that sort of undercuts the idea of control. I, as I've mentioned to the committee in the past, <coughs> tobacco is a product that is a controlled substance, but we really don't have control over because there are a thousand retailers. So it's very, very hard to do compliance testing at a thousand locations and do it at a, at a significant um, intensity that you really make a difference. So I don't, I don't know, you know if there's any limits contemplated or it's just going to be more of a free market system where anybody who wants to open a retail location just has to apply. If they meet the criteria, they can. Um, I think that, that will result in a similar challenge in, in getting and maintaining control of the sale of the product if you, you have, you know, hundreds of retail locations. So just something else just to be mindful of um, as, as, as you go forward in thinking about this. And I'm going to stop right here because I want to take seven minutes for um, a, a short break. This has been very informative. Just a reminder, we do not own this bill. Um, I appreciate the drive-by by, um, by Legislative Council. And um, we can talk. We can talk about this in our in our upcoming, you know, oh so copious amounts of free time. And if there's more that we want to sh uh, hear from from either um, Michelle or uh, the committee on what they're hearing, we we'll hear that just so that we can respond. This is a t this is a situation where the the committee of jurisdiction is asking us for an opinion on stuff that we focus on, and so we can write a memo based on what we've heard. We can take a little bit further testimony, but we don't. Um, um, but that's that's their request is to help make the bill uh, more solid. And so. Yeah. I was just going to say, um, if anybody has questions or you want to you know, get some more information mm -hmm. about anything, feel free to shoot me an email or drop by and see me down on the mezzanine. I'm happy to ask and talk with y'all offline if there's things you just want to kind of sort through that you don't want to take up committee time. Well, welcome to the third floor. I know. <laughs> well, I've been familiar with the third floor a lot this year over in Duff so it's really it's it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So um, thank you. But let's take let's take six minutes before we pick up on the minimum wage. All right, we're on the other end. Yes, we are. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are running just a few minutes behind, but um, we started a few minutes behind, so I guess we're on time. Um, we are switching gears, and we are going to back to minimum wage. Um, we are going to hear from, is Colleen here? Yeah. Hi, Colleen. I'm just going to introduce everybody first, and then we're going to go around the room. Um, Jill is here. I saw Charles. I saw earlier today. Is he still here? Hi, Charles. And um, that's going to be it. Michelle Fay is not here today and not available to testify. Um, for those of you who don't know, so we're just going to go around the room really quickly. Representative mm -hmm. Tom Stevens from Waterbury. Representative Matt Byron, Virgins. Randall Zott, Barner. Representative Lisa Hago from Berkshire. Representative Mariana Gamash from Swanton. John Kalaki, South Burlington. Tommy Waltz, Mary City. Mary Howard, Redland City. Chip Troiano, Standard. And we've been visited both um, earlier today and now by students from BFA Fairfax. Yeah. So welcome. They're here to see the legislative process. 
Um, so you're here on a you're here on one of the um, key bills of the year on minimum wage. So let's just start with um, Colleen. Okay. Wonderful. And if I sound like I'm talking faster at times, because I'm feeling like there's four weeks left of the session. <laughs> so, or so. Um, yeah, right. Or so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We're not trying to influence the pool. Did you put your two dollars down on that? Yeah. <laughs> That's why I said we're not trying to influence the pool. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I can only you can only play once. Yeah. You want in on that? Absolutely. You must have you the inside track. I'm good. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah of taking testimony. I know you testified on this bill in the Senate. I did. And if you could share that testimony or or better, um, that would be great. Okay, sounds great. Uh, well, first, um, thank you. I'm Colleen condon Kohau. I'm a native Vermonter, and I'm a second-generation business owner. I own three facilities in St. Albans, Vermont. I'm excited for BFA Fairfax to be here mm -hmm. in Franklin County. Um, some of you may have known my late parents, Phil and Tressa Condon. They were pioneers in long-term care in the state of Vermont. We've been caring for elderly uh, for about 40 years. So um, I, um, again, wanted to thank you for the opportunity to testify um, on increasing the minimum wage. We would love to be able to pay our staff in, um, over $15 an hour. However, long-term care is, because long-term care is demanding and rewarding work um, and certainly should be compensated fairly. Um, Franklin County Rehab Center and Villa Rehab Center are both five-star CMS rated facilities. Um, we have been recognized nationally as well as at the state level. Um, we have had multiple deficiency-free surveys from licensing and protection. Um, we were recognized, all three of my buildings um, have been recognized nationally for the Bronze Quality Award. And in September, or excuse me, October of 2018, um, Franklin County Rehab Center was honored with the very prestigious Silver um, Quality Award from the American Healthcare Association. And we are also pleased to be the recipients from the State um, Quality Award for both Franklin County Rehab and the Villa. Quality of care is extremely important and has been important um, in our work um, over the last 40 years. I'm gonna give you some just general highlights and overview of our facilities. Um, as I said, we have two skilled nursing facilities, Franklin County Rehab Center and the Villa, which um, encompasses 94 skilled nursing beds in Franklin County. Holiday House is a 42. Um, bed residential care home. <coughs> we employ over 236 employees between all three of our buildings. 57% um, are Medicaid recipients, 22% are self-pay or private, and 21% are Medicare um, recipients. Our labor and benefits account for about 54% of all of our costs. Unfortunately, we do not have the ability to absorb this kind of increase in our payroll without making significant reductions elsewhere. We calculated what this uh, S23's impact to our facilities would be. It's over $1.6 million. I want to highlight sort of what we get for daily rates or um, per hour for our buildings. Our residential care home, which is Holiday House, accepts ACCS, which is Community Medicaid, as well as the Enhanced Residential Care Medicaid program, which are very important as you look at the continuum of care and um, costs for facilities. You know, want to make sure people are being served mm -hmm. in appropriate levels of care. I get $2.52 per hour for her um, holiday house and we're open 24 hours a day staffed. Um, we're providing meals, staffing, medication management, um, obviously um, everything that comes with room and board. 
my skilled nursing facilities um, are 11 between uh, $10 and 41 cents per bed per hour to $11 and 38 cents per bed per hour so when you put all of those costs into place and you look at increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour um, that is extremely impactful because I don't always I, I can't start at $15 an hour I can't pay an LNA which is one of your most crucial um, licensed nursing assistant one of your most crucial um, positions they're the backbone they're the direct caregivers um, I cannot pay them $15 an hour when they're getting $15 an hour at McDonald's or at the local store so that is um, and then all and then it just um, cascades up because then you have license um, practical nurses your LPNs and then your RNs um, and I know you all know this but I am going to highlight the fact that we have an extremely difficult workforce environment right now in the state of Vermont I just got back speaking nationally I was asked to speak on a national panel um, about workforce <laughs> um, we just don't have enough physical bodies plus our unemployment rate as you know is 2.2% um, I will tell you one of the saddest days of my life was when I had to hire a staffing agency to hire a night nurse in September I have never in the history of my family ever had to do that we have a very high um, retention rate for our staff I am lucky to say that we've had staff with us over 35 years um, we have many staff that have been with us five years or more um, I actually cried that day because Staffing agencies present many difficulties. And um, it's hard. So I mean, I know that we're not gonna fix the workforce here, but I am saying to you <coughs> that healthcare in general has got a very significant, as well as, uh, you know, obviously Vermont. Um, you know, we've done some really great things, like I'm sure other of my compatriots have done. Um, you know, we're doing, um, strong orientation, strong onboarding, um, mentoring programs. I do nurse reimbursement programs. I have a lot of uh, LNAs that are in nursing school. I pay them additionally um, to see about um, having them become members of our facilities after. I have even started recruiting into Canada for nurses. I actually have about uh, four nurses that travel across the border. Um, as well as New York because um, uh, I'm able to some of the outlying areas of New York um, some of my nurses are coming from unlike other industries however I cannot reduce my staffing levels CMS dictates as they should um, appropriate staffing levels so I cannot raise my prices of a material good that I am giving um, because I am required to have the minimum staffing requirements and it's also crucial for um, quality of care um, I mean you know and these are not only state staffing requirements by uh, you know licensing and protection but these are CMS um, staffing ratios um, the long-term care uh, skilled nursing facility um, also within the last two years has um, had an additional 800 pages of new regulations that have come into place which have added new positions that have to be um, like infection control preventive preventionists and different things that are very important but that is costing my facilities another hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars I mentioned what our rates are um, and the fact that I care for about 57 percent of Medicaid recipients um, Medicaid inflation is about 1.8 percent per year which is well below what is needed to um, for the proposed uh, 7 to 9 percent minimum wage increases in addition to our low Medicaid reimbursement um, I'm not sure if you know but nursing homes are also facing Medicare reductions um, this year we anticipate 
through the buildings that would be over $25,000 in um, decreases from Medicare. Um, they're doing, and I can go into details, but they're doing a lot of different things um, and, um, you know, hospital readmission rates, and we're all working very hard for that. But it is, it is hitting the facilities, all of the facilities. We also pay 6% villa in Franklin County Rehab um, towards provider taxes, and we also pay property taxes. As I mentioned, we're in phase three of an implementation of new federal regulations that increase um, their focus is compliance and some other uh, major things this year. We also have a brand new payment mechanism coming in, uh, which is called PDPM, which they're totally um, revamping how we get paid. Um, it's probably the biggest revamp of payment for Medicare in 30 years. Um, again, our wages and benefits account for 54% of our facility's current costs and that would increase what it, that impact to me is 1.6 million dollars over that the only potential mechanism i can account for these changes would be reduce our employee benefits however this reduction is counterproductive i mean i'm having a struggle getting staff as it is and we're a good provider and we're you know we're a preferred provider and i'm proud to say that um, but we do have an existing workforce crisis, and um, I just can't raise um, my goods, you know, $5 extra, you know, per material good to cover that. Um, you know, my facilities run on less than a 1% margin. So it's not like I have multiple dollars um, to, to put towards this. And this is really critically going to potentially impact me if I can run my facilities and stay a Vermont owner. This is my livelihood. This is my profession. This is what I grew up in. I grew up as a little girl in a holiday house playing checkers with Mr. Berthium and caring for the elderly. It's in my soul. And I would love to pay a wage, but all I ask is if you do this, you need to make sure that you are going to understand that there has to be a balance and that you're going to have to pay for it on the Medicaid side. Um, in conclusion, um, I'm not fundamentally opposed to raising the minimum wage, but if you do enact S23, we need Medicaid to pay for it. These increased costs for nursing homes and residential care homes. In your residential care homes, um, there are some small mom and pop residential care homes. They're, they're maybe caring for five to ten people. I mean, they, they will not have the funds to be able to care for these people. Um, other states that have enacted significant increases in minimum wages have increased funding to nursing facilities beyond a traditional inflationary increase. I believe you have attached an outline of other actions that I think Toby has put in for um, other states have, take, um, have put in. Um, so I'm open for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I misheard you. Yes. Um, eight, 800 new pages of regulations? Yes. Yes. That's what I've been doing for the last three years. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. <coughs> yeah. I'm speechless. Yeah. That's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It does happen <laughs> upon occasion. <laughs> you pay the Federal Registry from CMS. Right. Okay. Oh, right. Actually, I had John first and then Tom. Sorry. Well, thank you for the work you're doing. Um, thank you. Yes. Just so I understand, you, you said that, and it's compelling, so I want to make sure I understand. Yes. Current status. You said if if the minimum wage moved in five years to fifteen dollars an hour, and that was what McDonald workers were getting, yes. you could not pay your LPNs. What are you paying your LPNs now? And how does that relate to current minimum wage? Yeah, I mean, they could, about um, seventeen or eighteen dollars an hour. So, um, okay. and as new grads. So you would have to raise, I mean, you would want at least, um, at least a five to six dollar, at least spread okay. on that. All right. 
That's what I want to Yeah, that, and I think I and I different. was trying to make sure I hit everything, but um, that includes. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure the FICA taxes, workers' comp. I mean, that's all in um, all those calculations of the one point over one point six million dollars. Okay. And uh, but that does not include um, the differential that I would have to pay the other staff. That's just the impact of the min wage. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You might not know the answer to this, but I'm hoping somebody in the room does. I, I'm curious about the 6% provider tax and where that goes. Sure. So, Toby, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Toby, I, okay. I'm Toby, sorry. Please identify yourself. Yep, Toby, I my healthcare association. So your provider tax um, is on a number of different providers, but it's used to draw down Medicaid funds from the feds. Federal matches. Uh, yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering what you pay your um, uh, your staff hourly on uh, upon hiring them. What's your starting wage? Twelve to twelve fifty. Twelve fifty. Twelve to twelve fifty depends on the. Yeah. I actually pay uh, ten seventy five at my residential care home. Okay, so yeah, it's a different scale then. Yes, personal care attendant is not a um, does not go through formal licensure. Oh, okay. So the personal care attendant um, starts about uh, ten fifty. They get twenty five cent increase to ten seventy five. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, are are these uh, employees um, part time? Do you have full uh, full time and part time combination of workers? I have a, yeah, we have a lot of full-time workers, but we have part-time part, part -time workers, but we pay benefits for... For part-time as well? After 17 years. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Ms. Brooks, on the power? Uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for your testimony and the work that you're doing. <coughs> what is your rate of turnover amongst your employees? Uh, we're about 40%, uh, which the national average is about 50%. Um, what happens, um, and it's mostly with your licensed nursing uh, assistants, truly um, they've come out of allied health programs at um, the tech centers, high schools. We also do um, t uh, LNA classes, and what I'll say to you is that not everybody is meant to be a care provider. So we tend to see um, that turnover happen within um, the first six months because they've figured out that maybe it isn't the right position for them. So that's where you see the biggest spread. You don't see, you don't see it within your nursing, you know, your professional nurses. Um, you know, obviously we run full kitchens, we wouldn't run full laundry. So you, you know, you'll see a bit of that in dietary, um, not as much in housekeeping or laundry. But. And my second question is, <coughs> the nurses that you you hire from Canada and New York, do you pay them at a higher rate? I, yes. Um, so the state of Vermont, well. The Canadian nurses, we do pay a higher, um, a higher rate from Canada so that they can, um, um, actually my assistant director of nursing um, comes out from Bedford every day. Um, and then the, there is a difference with um, li LPNs, licensed practical nurses. Um, Vermont tends to pay the LPNs at a higher rate and your RNs too from New York. So, if, you know, um, sort of over Elberg Rouse's point, like if they live on that sort of New York border. But we do have, we've had nurses come over from Plattsburgh, um, not recently, but I had a nurse traveling from Montreal. So. I represent the top of the um, Maybe I missed it. Just what percentage of people that utilize your facilities pay the full sticker price? Uh, 21%? Yeah. 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 Um, so, um, there are only four, I understand, are your nurses from Canada, they don't require health care, is that safe to say? They have it um, Yeah, I think um, I have uh, um, a couple, um, my assistant director does his health care in Canada because of his, that's where his family is. Right, so have, yeah. mm -hmm. But um, uh, we do offer health care benefits, a very um, yeah. good package to all staff are eligible for that. Um, we offer 401k with a 5% employer match. Um, you know, we really have tried to be um, an employer that is, um, you know, making sure that 
our employees. Um, well, I wanted to commend you for your care of our older Vermonters, for one thing, mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and also compliment you on the care that you uh, provide for your employees. I just wanted to say that. And did, could you tell me what your private pay rate is monthly? Sure. So monthly um, at our assisted living is uh, about $3,800. And at um, Franklin County and uh, the villa, um, we're about just under four hundred dollars. So about um, it depends. We have a couple of different room, but oh, four hundred dollars a day. So um, really? sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> then I'd really be out of business. <laughs> I shouldn't have any any business being in business. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you, must be having, you must be full of legislators. <laughs> you know what? I do care for some. I have cared for legislators, uh, judges, uh, all kinds of people. Farmers, hardworking Vermonters. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions, further questions for Colleen? Yeah, I appreciate you coming in and sharing your story. It is, it is, um, there is always uh, acknowledgement here that it is, especially folks who are in this, in your field, um, where it's difficult. I mean, and we know that, we know that care, like child care, is one of the most major expenses that anyone can have, especially if it's private pay. Yeah. Um, and yet the people who provide that care are usually amongst, I don't want to say the lowest paid, but certainly yeah. they deserve more compensation than what they receive. Yeah, and we're an aging state. Yep. And we have an aging workforce, yep. which is also yep. complicated. Mm -hmm. Covering yeah. birth to death now. Yes. Representative Ramosh. Yes, this is not a question, it's a comment you mentioned having care for some legislators, I believe you currently are caring for a former Franklin County judge. I can't specifically. I know, I'm just saying I am aware of this and I've heard nothing but very positive, very positive comments. So I just wanted to give you that feedback. Thank you. But thank you for your work and thank you for the services you provide. Thank you and thank you so much for having me come in today and or allowing me to testify. I really appreciate it. No, we, it's important for us to hear. Um, it's not, this is, this is not an easy issue. No, it's not. Um, especially when it, we're talking about cusp, what I would consider cusp positions. Um, so, but thank you for sharing your, your thoughts and your, and your business with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Jill Charbonneau. My name is Jill Charbonneau. I live in Middlebury, Vermont, and like Colleen, I'm a lifelong Vermonter, as probably many people in this room are. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the State of Vermont Labor Council, AFL-CIO. It's the voice of unionized workers at the state level. Essentially, we work to promote improved wages, health, and retirement <coughs> benefits, and working conditions with regard for the autonomy and, and integrity of affiliated unions, which essentially means that when we come to the legislature to testify on a bill or to sit in committee and learn about a bill, it's because a union affiliated with the AFL-CIO has asked us to do so. We uh, are not autonomous ourselves and say, oh, this is interesting. We can say, oh, this is interesting and contact a labor organization and find out if it's something that they would like us to follow. But we take direction from the dues-paying members, which people may or may not understand. Uh, Legislatively, we are charged with safeguarding and promoting the principles of collective bargaining, the rights of working people and consumers, and the security and welfare of all people. I'm a retired letter carrier and a member of the National Association of Letter Carriers, AFL-CIO. I am currently president of the Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. We support legislation for raising the minimum wage, paid family leave, 
and card check and enforcing current statutes concerning worker misclassification because these are issues relevant to the lives of working Vermonters. Many union workers have benefit that the benefit of wages higher than the current and proposed $15 an hour minimum wage, sick leave and retirement plans, but we believe these to be the rightful compensation of all workers. The committee has the opportunity to protect the dignity of workers in the new millennium. As technology changes the face of the workplace, we must continue to recognize the value of working people and their claim to a share of the wealth they make. McDonald's Corporation wealth exists because there is someone there to flip the burgers. Policy de decisions should re recognize the rights and protection of workers in the on-demand economy. During my tenure at the Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, I've made a point to work part-time at minimum wage jobs. I currently work predominantly with women, some of the young college graduates, some are young college graduates and students living with their parents, some have children, others are working a second job, and some are elder members of the workforce like me. There are a few full-time employment opportunities. During the slow periods, there are fewer work hours. Without my retirement benefits, I could not survive on the wages I, <clears throat> I make even if I work full-time. Working people deserve the dignity of being able to feed their family, put a roof over their head, send their kids to college, and set aside funds for retirement. Raising the minimum wage will raise the standard of living for many working Vermonters. A fair day's work deserves a fair day's work. Hey. And I presume that this is the kind of information that you hear at, on, under many different circumstances from the testimony that I've heard in this room and I presume you have heard this past session and this session. And, um, so if you could just talk a little bit more, just just in general, you, you served in a union, you, you didn't serve in a union, you worked while a member of a union, you had a, a, this union council. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how unions, why unions have an interest in this and when they negotiate, well, when they negotiate the, their powers and their ability to negotiate with their employers um, or the sector? And, and so it's interesting to see where unions would be supporting, in this case, mostly non-union workers. So we have traditionally, I mean, many of the benefits that come to people, whether it, even education, public education, the minimum wage to begin with, the 40-hour work work, these are all things that unions fought for. And we don't just, we, certainly there's a layer of protectionism there, but we don't just believe that members of the unions deserve these benefits. We believe that workers deserve these benefits and that, you know, I, one of the things of working in a minimum wage job that I really did not connect the dots on is people who work in low wage jobs have a, a discord with low income people who do not work and they feel that they go to work and they pay taxes and sometimes their standard of living because there is a certain uh, faction within this group who do not accept public assistance of any sort. So they feel like they're paying for someone to stay home. And, and I even heard of a fellow who works at uh, Breadloaf Construction, a, a, a supervisor there, say, well, today, in a really cold winter's day, today I'm going to work <coughs> to support people who stay home, essentially, is what he said. Um, and, the reality is, is that we are the richest nation on earth and how we care for our elderly, how we care for um, our children and how we care for people who suffer from even opioid addiction uh, is telling and we need to do a better job. And so here today, you have the opportunity to say that work has a value and that we recognize that senior citizens need care but we also recognize that the people giving care to senior citizens deserve a livable wage. And so that's that, that's just, I would say, <coughs> unionism in a nutshell, taking care of workers. Thank you. So how do you reconcile the type of testimony that we just heard previously, where an organization would love to pay their workers more because they're, they're providing
providing a very valuable service to the economy and to the very people who need it, the elderly or the infirm. With the reality that they are constrained by the reimbursements that they're given from these big um, organizations like Medicaid. You, so you, you control the Medicaid that? reimbursements, that's a state program, correct? So mm -hmm. when you raise, what I think I've heard in a couple of cases in this room, is when you raise the minimum wage, you have to raise the reimbursement rate. And I think I have heard <coughs> testimony from last year, although I haven't followed this bill that closely <coughs> this year, that as people earn more money, they will pay more money in taxes. And then as they earn more money, they will receive less benefits from the state. So there is going to be a flow of money into the state uh, which have, might have the availability to use for these circumstances. So thank you. My knowledge of this bill, although limited, is um, <laughs> unfortunately, is that there is no provision to raise those Medicaid reimbursements in conjunction with this bill. So I think that the woman that I heard testify yesterday asked that, in fact, when you pass this bill, that you put those uh, restrictions in there. So is that something your organization would um, support? Yeah, we, we support uh, Medicaid reimbursement. It's good for uh, the caregivers, and it's also good for the patients. And, you know, many of us, if it's not ourselves, my mother is on long-term care with uh, Medicaid. So even if I don't get Medicaid, there are people in my community and my family that benefit from mm -hmm. it. And I think as taxpayers and the wealthiest nation on earth, we got to at some point in time say, we care enough about our population to say that there's a baseline of care that should be available mm -hmm. to them. And this bill addresses this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Charles. Welcome. Charles Martin, Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Thank you to the chair and the committee for having me in. Um, I'm going to read a brief statement and then touch on a few additional points. For everybody. The Vermont Chamber of Commerce represents nearly 1,500 members from all industries and sectors of Vermont's business community. Informed by routine engagement with our diverse membership, the Chamber prides itself on maintaining a knowledgeable perspective on issues impacting Vermont's employees and employers. After carefully considering the concerns of countless Vermont businesses, all of whom are dedicated to providing their employees the best possible compensation packages, the Chamber continues to oppose an increase to the minimum wage beyond level statutorily in place. Proposals to increase the minimum wage above levels mandated by current statute will, if enacted, disproportionately impact small businesses, including those businesses, current and future employees. The reality stands that burdening Vermont's business community with an additional costly mandate will interfere with natural growth, including by limiting the ability of employers to organically expand compensation and benefits in a consistent and sustainable manner. We're proud that Vermont maintains one of the nation's highest minimum wages currently, but with that said, we have concerns about a proposal to continue to raise the wage by an additional 40% over the next few years, when most Vermont businesses will not see equivalent revenue increases to offset such cost pressures. We celebrate Vermont businesses who currently pay above minimum, the current minimum wage, but caution individuals who believe that employers paying below that amount are doing so for any other reason than business survival. Our members also have serious concerns about tipped wage rates. The tourism industry is an important part of the Vermont economy, and our restaurant bonds are a major reason why people enjoy Vermont. Current law requires tip minimum wage rates to increase at 50% of the minimum wage rate. We believe that Vermont should decouple these two rates if the bill is to advance. This would allow restaurants to pay their non-tipped employees in the back of the house a higher minimum wage and allow tipped employees to continue to earn above the minimum wage, or at the very least, the new minimum wage. In summary, the Chamber continues to support indexing the minimum wage to inflation, as is reflected in current law. If we are to increase the minimum wage additionally, we suggest extending the phase-in period to 2028 and decoupling the tipped and minimum wage rates. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Yeah. <coughs> All right. Uh, another couple of issues I'd bring up. Uh, we hear from 
virtually every one of our businesses that they're struggling to find a workforce. This committee probably hears that more than you know a lot of other committees in this building. And that includes businesses that are paying much higher than $15 an hour um, for people who are working in semi-skilled labor on factory floors and jobs like that. Um, I'd also ask the committee to consider that as far as total value to employees, um, if an employer generally looks at benefits and salary as one number, in a lot of cases they do anyway. If one portion of that is mandated, i.e. salary, the other portion in order to achieve solvency in their overall price projection or cost projection for the year, they're going to have to decrease one part of that number, probably the unmandated portion of benefits. Um, I'd also like to restate something I heard from people who are kind of on the pro side of this. I've heard it from a few people. Uh, it's just simply that quote, and I quoted this because I found it interesting. Um, a lot of businesses will be able to sustain these increases, unquote. Uh, <coughs> one could deduce that that would also mean a lot of businesses will not be able to sustain these increases, so I'd ask the committee to consider that heavily when moving forward, if moving forward with this bill. Um, I also heard that we need to do this so the whole state increases from the same sort of proponents of the bill that doing this as a state allows all goods and services to rise in tandem across the state, thereby not competitively disadvantaging any one business. I tend to agree with that rhetoric, um, but I'd also ask people to see that that means we would be at a competitive disadvantage regionally and nationally because we'd be a state with a higher minimum wage. Um, I'd like to kind of end with, we've all been mm -hmm. talking about who's a um, multi-generational Vermonter still alive, and I'm a multi-generational mm -hmm. Vermonter as well. Uh, I grew up in a general store, so this issue hits a little close to home. I know all about payroll stress. I know all about treating your employees as well as possible within the fiscal needs of the business owner. And I did some very quick math, which is dangerous to do in the witness chair, um, but I'll try to broadcast it accurately. We had sort of a Walmart of 1870 is kind of how we fra we tried to frame our store. You could get anything there. We just had a smaller inventory than a big box store, and we did this in rural East Print. Generally, we had three employees on staff for 14 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. If you multiply that by the projected increase to $15 an hour from now, that's $4.22. It makes about 65 k a year in additional payroll that my parents would have had to come up with to pay their employees. Now, the argument is that people in Corinth or in the greater economy will start spending more because they'll be earning more. I think you would have a hard time trying to convince my parents of that um, because generally the customers that came through are people who are buying a coffee and an egg sandwich on the way to work. I don't see that they would suddenly start buying five coffees and five egg sandwiches on the way through to work. And I'd add that we lost a lot of customers because general store prices are already very high and suddenly the box store 15 minutes down the road becomes a much more you know, lucrative and financially sensible option. So I'd argue that you'd hemorrhage customers from a lot of these small businesses. And, and that number, 65K in additional unobligated profits, just seems highly unlikely. For most people, there might be a few businesses in the state that would be able to swing that, but that certainly would not have happened in our little corner of Vermont when I grew up in a general store. And with that, I'll open up to additional questions. Out of the 1,500 clients that you have, um, are they all small mom and pop stores or do they include big box stores as well? They include big box stores. And I'll say confidently that big box stores could probably afford this at, have a much easier time doing this than small businesses. Thus it's usually the nature of any sort of mandated business policy or regulation. Um, but the vast majority of the chamber's businesses are somewhere around 20 or less employees. The vast majority by, I just have the statistic fresh in my mind, but it's about 80%. Um, so only a small margin of our businesses are sort of, you know, thousands of employees spread out around the nation. Uh, we don't, not that there's anything wrong with Walmart, but we don't represent Walmart. So, you know, the, the biggest we have are kind of our Vermont businesses that are large businesses. Kind of on a, <coughs> Uh, I keep saying philosophical note to my, in my head, but and I realize that the chamber represents the businesses in, in Vermont. But what do you say? We what, one of the things that makes this difficult is that we hear we hear this story, and then we hear the stories 
on the other side, on, from an employee's perspective, that says um, it's really difficult for me to make ends meet on you know this current minimum wage, and and on the other hand, we can say, oh look, we're just talking about the minimum wage. Not everybody makes a minimum wage, but we know from our Vermont income tax filings that 144,000 Vermonters make less than $27,000 a year. They make an average of about $15,000 a year. Mm -hmm. um, how do we, uh, in our work, and I go, and again, I totally appreciate that you work for an organization that advocates for businesses. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, businesses need employees to work, and yet employees are saying, or the, the statistics show that many, st many employees who work in these um, service industries are making less than twenty-seven thousand dollars a year. Um, where do we? Where do? Where do the scales of justice fall? Um, and, and and that might be I an mean, unfair question to you. It's agree. a tricky question that I could probably get myself into trouble with, but I would probably argue something along the lines of natural economic growth. Um, I would say that, with the case of the small business in the rural town. If that general store folds, those wages, which I won't argue aren't high enough to have a, you know, joyful, carefree life, <laughs> will be non-existent. So, I'm not sure the answer to that question entirely, but I know for the majority of our members, it's not an increase to the minimum wage um, beyond those already in statute. Um, Representative Zott. So it's kind of a follow-up to your question because you know we have this like oscillating frame of reference where on the one hand we have someone who says like look at the workers and we have someone else who comes in and says look at the small businesses and so we're you know as the chair was referencing there's we're trying to weigh this scale like where do we where do we find this balance and the, or we had just we just had testimony from uh, someone yesterday from the. Uh, whose business was largely predicated on taxpayer subsidies, and we had someone just a moment ago whose business was mostly predicated on taxpayer subsidies. Um, and I guess my, my, my question, such as it is, is we're asked to sort of have sympathy for the small business that might go under based on um, market forces, right? Um, but many of the same entities that want us to have sympathy for them, don't mind necessary repercussions for the workers based on market forces. By not, what do you mean just by virtue of not raising their wages? Well, or like the displacement of industry or something, right? Like, so we say, oh, well, the economy's evolving, right? Automation's coming, and so we just sort of accept mm -hmm. that this is a result, result of, in your language, like maybe or, organic, organic expansion of the economy or something, right? Mm -hmm. So the, it becomes this question for me where I'm, I'm not entirely sure who the, who the free market advocates are that come in here. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Because it's, it's always that it, whenever it's to your financial benefit, it's we should let the free market work. But then when it begins to jeopardize something to you, then it's like, well, maybe not the free market. And like I said, we just had these two entities who came in who's like, 79% of one of the businesses and 84% of the others are like essentially taxpayer money keeping them afloat. Mm -hmm. So the market's clearly not working. Right. Because otherwise, you know, she said she had 21% of her people paying um, market rate and the other 79 didn't. Mm -hmm. So if the market was allocating its resources efficiently, everybody would be able to just be. <coughs> well, I don't think the chamber subscribes. We don't have like an ideological statement that guides what we we wouldn't describe ourselves as passionately free market because we've come in this building and at, like, just this year we've argued for additional regulation of the Airbnb market. So I mean, like you said, uh, we kind of consider things on a case by case basis on what works for Vermont communities on a localized level. Um, national conversations are always relevant, uh, but we tend to just focus on the needs of our members with the issue at hand. Um, but I agree that it's a it's a endless kind of struggle to find the right balance. Um, I know you all are tasked with doing that in the most objective way possible. But I have the pleasure of being a little subjective and advocating for businesses. Uh, Representative Hango, that tram. 
two things. One, I want to thank you for bringing a personal example to us because so often we hear about a theoretical example. So that was nice and refreshing to hear. And the other is to Randall's point, I think we need to almost remove the healthcare industry from this um, economic model because healthcare is not working on an economical model, on an economic model um, at this point. Healthcare, by its very nature, is subsidized. So I don't think that's a, an accurate um, portrayal of anything that Mr. Martin was trying to get at. Represent Toronto. So I, you know, when I, I go into my community, I go to Willie's store, which is in Greensboro, been in business 109 years, and I talk to the owner and about you know wages and benefits fairly often, and you know his retention rate is amazing. I mean, he's had people there for 20 years uh, working in various departments and whatnot, and uh, the employees are quite content. But um, he is always in favor of um, increasing wages and uh, and. Um, and benefit packages. So I thought, you know, I, I kind of listened to that, and I think in terms of, uh, okay, so you know, when you get an increase in your wages, productivity goes up, uh, retention rates go, uh, uh, go are higher, and training costs are lower. So I don't hear about those types of savings oftentimes when um, I hear from chambers and various advocates. Uh, uh, in your position. So, you know, I just, that's something that I have to add into the weight equation that we've been just talking about and, and consider that, you know, there are some things that work as a result of increasing these wages. No, absolutely. I think, I mean, I really do think, truly, I, I believe on a personal level that each Vermont you know, business in its own situation, in its own little hamlet, we have, we're, you know, sort of a economically and geographically isolated state where there's you know trends that exist in one place that don't in the other. I'll add that on my personal note, my parents' store was run very well. This legislature recognized it as one of the finest stores in Vermont um, around the around two thousand when we were still operating it. Um, but it just wouldn't have been, this would not have made much sense for us and we did retain our employees. We didn't have yeah. hard, we had hardly any turnover. I mean a death was probably like the most common reason for somebody to leave because generally it was folks that worked 30 feet down the street on Main Street in Corinth, and it was very convenient to walk, walk to work. Representative yeah. Byron. Um, have you talked to you or any of your members, um, you know, small, meter, medium, or large businesses, about what their payroll percentages were during the recession? And I mean, we have a more robust economy right now. We have concerns about an economic downturn. You know, I've heard year and a half, two years, and then what sort of like how this proposed wage increase would apply to that if they saw say like a twenty percent reduction in sales. Uh, that's definitely data I could I could track down. Um, I haven't specifically approached this from what the recession will do to businesses if they're mandated to increase, yeah. but I've heard that I've heard that brought up by economists in this chair who are more intelligent than I when it comes to numbers. Um, but I can I can look at that from a chamber perspective and get back to you for sure. Yeah, I mean, because when we talk to the economists, it's just sort of this like broad ranging, like binary conversation. But I think like hearing it from the people who have to live it and experience it, mm -hmm. from how do we manage our payroll to sales to doors open to. It seems like we're. I mean, from my perspective, I and mean, I had a much different policy area before I came to the chamber in October. <laughs> um, but it seems like Vermont, you know, with the sort of local board movement, etc. Mm -hmm. There's Every little area is so unique in the way that they do business in our state and the way they keep their business going and the way they adjust that I don't know if we have quite as much of a luxury as of other states to do these broad maps that say everything will be better for everybody or everything will be worse for everybody. But I'm sure that there's businesses who responded in unique and interesting mm -hmm. ways to that. No, I'm just kind of like with businesses that were especially around pr uh, previous to the, the downturn in 08 09, like what they saw for a retraction in sales. And then, like, compare, you're sort of comparing like labor costs to that, then what a seven percent a year increase would look like to like an estimated retraction. No, I'll, I'll track all that down and, and provide it to the committee for sure. Okay. If I can get 
membership for membership for yeah, just yeah. to provide it to me. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, all right, we can go off the record. Thank you, everybody. Let's go to lunch. Pretty full up. <laughs> uh,